YouTube is what I said. Well, I was just going to say, honestly, since the last time we had council liaison reports, I don't think I've had much. business owner group that had problems with the Sunday market, the farmer's market down there. And I met with um, <clears throat> he and some other business owners and uh, his wife and <clears throat> Marty and uh, Debbie Mullahan and, and Jessica and another board member were, were there. And uh, we kind of ironed it out. We were standing in their parking lot <clears throat> for over an hour. And, uh, you know, we did some things poorly as far as noticing and uh, really blocked their driveway on a Sunday and pretty much closed the whole street. And uh, so that was unacceptable to them and um, cost them a lot of money. Uh, the, the car wash, Kiss Car Wash was also uh, involved on that. And <clears throat> basically when you, when you close down Tiger Street, people would come from the Washington Square area that didn't really know there was no detour signs or anything they would just get there it's stub they'd have to turn around and go go away so uh, kiss car wash saw a pretty good reduction in uh, their business on that those days but uh, but I think we came up to a pretty good solution they moved it back further into <clears throat> uh, rotary plaza and uh, but the problem was the distancing they had to have the table six feet apart uh, for COVID related reasons and um, it just kind of made it very spread out that's why they wanted the whole Tiger Street so basically right now half the Tiger Street is closed but you can get through there and there's a fence and <clears throat> anyway people seem to be happy no lawsuits coming and because uh, because that was a that was a potential because of the, uh, the notice and of course we're dealing with an attorney so uh, that's right where he went so anyway that's uh, that was one one deal uh, met with the regional water consortium um, <clears throat> let's see nothing to really report on that um, I told uh, I told the mayor. I, I texted him that uh, Russ Axelrod from West Lynn resigned. Did everybody hear that? It wasn't exactly that. <clears throat> he uh, he texted me back and said that um, the papers kind of got it wrong. He is going to stay until the end of his term, but not not uh, go out for the next election cycle. So he didn't really quit on the spot like the uh, papers seem to say, but. He is going to stay on and <clears throat> finish up his term. So that was interesting. A little gossip there. Uh, that's it. When it, When is his term up, Tom, since you've been keeping up on the West Lynn uh, politics so closely? I think it's I think it's done in November. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Ah, so that was sort of him announcing he's not, not rerunning. Yeah, yeah, he'd have to decide to rerun or not for this November election. Got it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, Youth Councilor Calderon. Yeah, so TIAC had a meeting yesterday, like Council Newton said. 
the only I just have two quick things about them. They're looking into possible online or distance uh, community service opportunities because since you can't go in person and there's a lot of high schoolers that need their community service hours, I think that that's going to be something pretty big this school year. And then I talked to them about the Transformation Commission. All of them seem pretty happy about how it's going. No specific criticisms or anything that they'd like to change. So that's all I have. I know it's not distanced but uh, for community service, but uh, is Tyak looked at Packed with Pride as a possible service group to work with? Yeah, that was the one idea that we have currently, and I know that uh, Natalia, our president, is working with one of our members who has already done Pack with Pride, and I think that they're going to figure something out. I mean, not that that will take care of the whole need, but it seemed like an opportunity, perhaps, because I know they're needing volunteers, and many high school students can even drive. Mm-hmm. With boxes, not necessarily with friends, but with boxes. Uh, okay, Can Youth Counselor Calderon, anything else? No, that's it for me. Thank you. All right, Council President Goodhouse. Good meeting. Um, yes, so I've been a, l a little busy. So um, for a Youth Counselor Calderon, um, I'm a board member of Family Promise, and, and they're, they're kind of looking maybe for volunteers. I might be a organization that serves a lot of tigered families and helps out so it might be something to reach out to them and see if they need any help or anything like that they do uh when people move in they need help moving furniture staging new, new places to live and so that they um right now i think they have some um, people that are up there in age that have to move some of that stuff so i think that if they had some young bodies to help maybe move some stuff around that'd be great and that kind of leads into a part of mine um i'm on the board of family promise they're doing a lot of work with tigered families uh putting uh in Tigard hotels, so there's a lot of families are there. They they do need need for uh, donations for either household items or food items. So um, they're always looking for if there's any extra like uh, coffee tables or linens or or you know kitchen supplies or things like that or even food because they're they have a whole lot of families housed in uh, Tigard hotels and helping them out. Um, and that was also the service project that the Tiger leadership we did. We put a place structure so when things do get back to normal, their day center is out there off of Stafford. But they are looking at, and it's something maybe in the future we look at with some of the CET um, money or things like that. They want to find a place in Tiger they can have, a home they can renovate and turn into a day center or anything like that. Um, so we might look at for future council goals and we can look at some way to make little little places like that available for these um, Nonprofits that do provide housing for um, homeless people. Um, on the WIF Commission, things are going well with the Willamette Intake Facility. Um, we had that meeting that's going on well as long as well. Um, the WA Board Meeting um, going to be coming up. There's going to be a decision to take a look at whether or not to uh, endorse the upcoming Metro Get Moving 2020 measure. So that's going to be a pretty in-depth debate and whether or not what the vote and what direction to go on that. And I suppose us as a council will have to take a look at that. But um, as people probably read, there's going to be a lot of different sides on it with the way they went decide to go with employer tax and then also kind of a little snafu at the end of, of uh, excluding government agencies not being able to tax them. Uh, coming up on Thursday and Friday with the National League of Cities, they're holding an equi uh, equity uh, summit. So kind of uh, in line with what we're talking about tonight, there's going to be two days full of an equity summit that I'll be attending virtually on Thursday and Friday. So I'm looking forward to that. That's packed full of um, how cities can, can jump on this issue and work on it. So it'll be, uh, it should be pretty interesting and, and a lot of information I'll gather from that. And I can, um, in the next liaison report, I can talk about that. Had the uh, leadership graduation, leadership tiger graduation. The mayor spoke at that as well. Um, that was a great event. Um, and a lot of those people are looking at really getting active in the community or anything they can or even on um, city committees. And that was a great group. Uh, another thing I had with the uh, NLC is a transportation infrastructure subcommittee is um, had Dave Roth. He uh, spoke on that and he presented our uh, Street for People. And uh, when I was talking to Dave about that, he was kind of surprised and even Kenny was surprised that 
um, why why such on a national level why cities would be interested is they thought it was kind of a, an average project we're working on but it's really getting a lot of attention the uh, the committee really loved to add a lot of questions looked at it in depth and um, and, and, and kind of helps that committee too when they're going to the feds asking for money for trails and projects because it could show that we're having to try and find solutions getting around um, trails that should be de developed or streets um, with sidewalks that should be developed so it gives even more of a cost on the federal level for us to talk to the federal legislators to get more money for trails for uh, sidewalks in these areas that need the money um, and then uh, TTAC had that meeting. Um, they're really concerned about the uh, the hall station for the light rail. They're the same thing as council. They're they're worried that it's not going to be a proper stop. It's not going to have the cross that we need. That they're going to develop the area, and, and they're working on writing a letter to um, council, metro, TriMet, anyone they can, as they're they're saying kind of echoing the same things we've talked about at council that they want to make sure that's a developed properly in there that this hall boulevard is properly adaptive that people can cross the street that there's enough parking and they, they're not really satisfied with how that's turning out or the responses and also been working with the uh, national league of cities for the cities are essential um, working with talking with congress and congress members and senators on just the importance of the money we need for the cities working on that 500 billion plus um, every time we think we're making headway then we seem to hit a different roadblock as far as getting that money to the cities, but just really trying to make it important to show that we need that money. A lot of the money went to the states, but not going to the cities. So it's all pushing that one, and we'll still see what happens in that angle. And that's the that's the majority of what's going on lately. I was just making a note. Sorry, hold on a second. Um. Anybody have questions for anybody else? And then I'll give a couple of updates and maybe we can actually talk about Get Moving 2020. That was on my list of things as well. Um, but anybody have any questions for anybody that gave a report out? The only thing I was gonna say was just also on the, um, on the, uh, with the farmer's market, sounds like they're gonna utilize now the, the Rotary Plaza and uh, do it one lane of traffic one way. It looks like the fix is going to be. Um, last time I was talking to Jessica, though, the one the one dilemma they're running into is they're going to have to put some kind of barricade up between the the booths for the farmers market and the road going through there. So they're looking at the cost of how to, you know, it's not cheap to get those rent offenses or anything like that. Or um, the other problem they have in the in the plaza is if they uh, block the trail or how they, how they can work around the trail so they have limited spots they can do in there as well. But it sounds like they're coming, like Tom, like Councilor Anderson is saying, that they're, they're coming up with at least some kind of solution. But the, uh, the market's going strong and, and um, more and more vendors are still showing interest in, in new vendors are showing interest in the market. Okay. Um. Let's talk about, so all the things I would bring up would be, they're not necessarily report outs from specific meetings, but topics that have been coming up that I think we need to talk about from various uh, sessions and meetings I've been in. So one is around get, the Get Moving 2020 transportation package. I think probably every single one of you have now received some sort of a, uh, a phone call. Well, maybe Youth Counselor Calderon, maybe you didn't get hammered but um, I'm guessing everybody else has been hammered by um, various elected officials trying to put pressure on you to uh, consider endorsing the measure and it sounds like they just there's sort of an assumption that I'm endorsing it I'm not sure where that came from but uh, other than I've said that I supported the package well before they decided on a payroll tax and then decided to exempt local government and state government from it. But um, And I've shared my concern about that. But I guess I want to have a conversation with the whole council about, you know, is this something that we even want to agenda for a, uh, you know, for council consideration as a formal council? endorsement of it um i'm not even sure where everybody's at personally because i know uh, a number of you've called me and have concerns i know um mayor bubinex got concerns mayor gibson's got concerns lots of people are i think our chamber of commerce has gone from 
maybe being a mild supporter to now probably opposing it as well. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to gauge uh, everybody's perspectives on that. And uh, Youth Councilor Calderon, even though you've not been lobbied probably for this, you're certainly welcome to put your, your two cents in. And if you want to know more about what the, you know, what the whole thing is, please let us know and we can give you more context too. Um, but Councilor Newton, you want to start? on that sure um i have some concerns i um right now i'm not even sure from what i've heard in the you know little i'm hearing looking at the newspaper it sounded like maybe there was going to be a change in the amount i talked to kenny asher yesterday and um he said that it was being appealed um and so we've got that issue in front of us I share the concerns that are what the ballot, uh, the ballot title the is ballot, being contested, the ballot, or the, the yeah, that's what I understand. So there's an appeal, okay. Um, okay. and I don't know. I was going to try to follow up on that today, but I lost today. So, um, so, and I have the same concerns about the Hall Street Station that I think the our Urban Renewal uh, Committee has expressed, and so I I feel. A, I, I just have a lot of questions. I'm, I'm not sure about the funding source and I'm concerned about, it, it seems to be fluid right now. So to be honest with you, I don't know what I'd be endorsing. I'm not sure, you know, where we're going because the article in the paper said President Peterson was, had approached the business community about an alternative, but they clearly weren't supportive of that. So can anybody enlighten me on where we are? That would be helpful if you know. <laughs> I was going to say I don't know more than that. I, Council President Goodhouse, do you or Councilor Anderson? I so, see Heidi shaking her head. No. <laughs> what I heard is they went to the 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 business community and they said rather than and, I'm, and numbers might might be right, but rather than seventy two cents, they'll make it sixty cents. And the business community says you're missing the point. It's not a matter of what the exact amount is. It's the way you're doing the funding where you're putting it all in the backs of the business. And so I think Metro is still out of touch and, not, and, 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 and doesn't get it. it. Kind of the same way thing as the mayor said, where, you know, kind of calling for an endorsement and presuming that there's already endorsement without really listening to all the details. And I don't think they're listening to the true concerns of Nike and Intel and the whole business community and the chambers. They're thinking it's just the, the percentage amount or the dollar amount, and that's not it. It's the whole putting it all in the backs of the businesses um, the, the exclusion of the, the government agencies and maybe not looking at gas tax or other ways or really spreading it out, but really putting it all in the back of them is a problem. And so I think Metro needs to relook it and kind of listen more in detail and actually hear it rather than gloss over and think, oh, this is going to pass no matter what. I think they're used to passing their, uh, you know, the homeless initiative that passed, the, the parks have, all the, all the different initiatives they put in the ballot pass no problem but they've never had any formal opposition. So I think they need to realize that there's gonna be formal opposition and they need to start listening in closer. Um, Mr. Mayor, I will say one more thing. I talked to, as I mentioned, I talked to Kenny Asher yesterday and he was really helpful. He told me, and I wasn't aware of this, that in June, we sent a proposal to TriMet about a reworked alternative for the Hall Street Station which he's hopeful um, TriMet will be receptive to, make some changes that make it a better site. They're supposed to get back to us in August. Um, it's August, but it's only the 11th of August, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and Councilor Newton, that was, I think when you, and I, when you and I talked, that was what I was referencing about our, uh, you know, an alternative. I'm okay. sorry I didn't give you as much detail probably as I, maybe I should have, but um, that, both Council President Goodhouse and I, as the members of the council on the um, on the transportation, the t Tiger Transportation Strategy Group, we we do get briefings on that. And um, yes, that proposal is uh, being considered. And and we've kind of, I mean, that was. I think I shared with some of you that uh, that was in part the results of us saying look at do we need to have a more serious conversation where you know mayor snyder needs to come into the process again because i've now had to insert myself two or three times to get 
um, the appropriate attention and make this level of seriousness clear with um, various teams at TriMet about um, what we need and expect and what and what has to happen for us to to support the program and and believe that it's in the best interest of our community. So this was this almost got to that point, but they agreed to actually look at it just with the threat of that, not with it actually happening. So that was good. It was a step in the right direction. So that's all the comments I have. Thanks. Okay. Um, Councillor Anderson, thoughts? Um, I know TriMet is very aware of uh, Tiger's unhappiness. I've heard that. So they say, well, what's going on with Tiger? I said, well, you know, it's all Boulevard. It's all whole Boulevard. Okay, so um, as far as the, uh, the levy, you know, they took it out to polling. Lynn loves her polling. Lynn Peterson loves the polling. And the payroll tax pulled better than anything else. And that's why they stuck on it. They went away from the gas tax and the car registration tax, which I think is a mistake because this is a transportation bond. Because I think the city of Portland wanted to raise their gas tax. And the state wants revenue from the car registration um, fees. So there's some negotiation still going on. I think I think it's probably, right now it's at 0.75%. I think it's probably going to get down to about under 60%. But it's a, it's a very large tax. And just, <clears throat> just to let you know, Nike, the, the CFO of Nike says that that's the largest tax that they have had from any city that they work in. So it really does affect their personnel. And uh, <clears throat> they're, you know, they're not going to eat it. They're going to pass it on to some of their employers. But it's, it's large. So it's, uh, it's still fluid. I don't, I don't think that we need to come out with anything yet because it's, uh, it's not set. Well, with, with all due respect to the Nike CFO, the fact that their world headquarters is not contained within a city would kind of make that true almost by default. But I understand the point that it's a big, it's a big impact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Youth Caster Calderon. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, like you said, I haven't heard nearly as much as you guys, uh, haven't been called ever. Uh, probably because I'm a youth city councilor, in my opinion, uh, I can't endorse officially, so uh, I don't think that matters as much. But I would love to see more information. I also don't know nearly as much about taxes as any of you guys do. So if someone could brief me or send me any information regarding this, I would love to see that. Who, who would like to brief youth councilor Calderon? And if nobody volunteers, I'll do it. But I'm guessing one of our very knowledgeable city councilors would be willing to take that on uh, I can do it okay so yeah. Councillor Anderson you can outreach to youth councilor Calderon in the next week or so we'll do it <clears throat> okay uh, Councillor Lou what do you have you know I just I want to echo what everyone else is saying I have some serious concerns about the funding structure and what it means for our businesses who are really struggling right now and I know, you know, the thing, what I heard the pushback is, well, it's not going to be till 2022. It's like, um, it's not that far away. And, you know, I feel like our economic recovery is going to be tough getting out of this. And so I, I worry about the funding and the fact that I think we're, we're still struggling to get really excited about these stations to ensure that they're done correctly. Um, because this is a major infrastructure, pro you know, um, thing for Tigard. And it's really important to get it done right. And so um, I'm just, I'm really on the fence about it. And so I feel like without more information, especially knowing, especially feeling like, you know, Metro is still kind of wishy-washy on the, the amount um, that we don't even know what we would straight be endorsing. So I think the conversation should wait until there's a better defined plan and information. <coughs> You, uh, you br Councillor Lube, you bring up a point that has led me, and I've already said this to, I think, Council President Goodhouse, is that one thing we could consider doing at some point is, and I just want you all to think about this, 
would be to support the projects, but not necessarily the funding mechanism. So think about that too. Council President Goodhouse, thoughts? Yes, and I, and I just had a chuckle for a moment, Councilor Lou, when you when you're flashed over to you and I saw the back of the cat. So <laughs> that was hilarious. It's sort of my cat, I have a gray one. <laughs> um, you, you, you kind of read my mind there, Mayor. Um, I mean, I, I agree with everyone else, but I think if, if, especially if this is being appealed, it might be worthy of us to think about whether or not we want to send some kind of message, whether it's um, online or offline, to Metro to say that um, that we don't approve of the funding measure, that we would, uh, you know, I, I talked to you briefly, uh, Mayor, about it, and, you know, if, if they would have maybe done something where they reached out to the government agencies and said, well, we're not allowed to tax you, but will you still, will you still sign on and still um, be partaking this this tax and, and pay for it, or do something else? I think that it, it's going to be, it's going to kill the, or it's going to be a hard obstacle to overcome on the campaign to have that out there saying that, you know, what's, what's, you know, good for you is not, you know, you know, not good for us. It's something that, well, oh, you guys pay it, but the government agencies don't have to pay it. Um, and maybe looking at other ones, even though, like Councilor Anderson said, maybe with the vehicle registration and the gas tax are afraid of it, but I think if you spread it out more, we're, we're lucky to have Intel and, and Nike and those those companies here that really have all those feeder companies into there. And if we, we do such a big push, um, on them, we either risk losing those companies or also not having the support of the business community, the chambers, everything else. This is going to be a, a hard blow to the campaign. So I think maybe if we single some way offline or online to them, and I agree too with the projects. We've, we've already discussed that multiple times at council or TST uh, or things like that, that TriMet still doesn't quite seem to acknowledge what Tiger needs and, and what we want from the Right World project. So, um, if we're not too happy about it, we're kind of on both sides. We're not happy about the project. We're not happy about the funding measure. So, um, and maybe they might even be watching this and hearing these anyway. So, or or we can direct them to watch this. But I'm really, I'm in favor of the projects, and and I and I like the the project coming through and the, all the different corridor projects. But Trimet needs to step it up, and we need to have a better funding package. On the offline comments, I've already signaled to President Peterson into her own ear um, while we were at an event that I felt like they biffed a couple issues with it. So I think she's already got the offline part of it. Whether we want to send something formal, we can certainly, you know, talk about it. That might be, uh, you know, coming from the whole council, maybe that's even a little stronger than just, uh, you know, me as the mayor saying it. I don't know. I think it needs to be more formal, and I think it needs to be more black and white. From what I've conversations I've had with people, it seems to be a little bit of tone deaf that death that's coming from Metro, where um, some of what you said, where I think there's kind of presumption that people are supporting this or all in favor of it, and they're not catching the the minute details of people aren't happy about some of the part of the project or they're not happy with the funding measure, and they're just skipping past it. And so sometimes we'll get their attention most if there's a letter saying, "Hey, fix a few parts of this." If you want our support does uh, does everybody support sending a letter like that I do I have a question when's the, ahead, deadline? when's the deadline to file for November for, to file the measure well they filed the measure that's okay. what's being contested now okay that's what I thought so it's on the way it's on at this point right I mean there's no unless changes. It's, unless it's contested, you can go back to the drawing board. Right, right, yeah, exactly. So are you just wondering whether there's value in sending a letter then, Councillor Newton? Is that the implication of your question? Well, I'm just wondering if it's already been filed um, and the only way to move it off is to have it appealed and then, then rethink it, then that needs to be, the, you know, we need to recognize that in the context of the letter. We're talking about moving forward in terms of the campaign, not in terms of perhaps affecting the measure, is what I'm hearing. Well, I think it needs to be both. I, you know, if they're if they're rethinking it or they're going to pull it off the ballot, I think they still have a uh, time where they could pull it off the ballot, but they probably okay. can't file a new one. A new okay. one. Okay. Okay, that clarifies it for me. Thanks. And my question so is, there's usually a later deadline for that. Go ahead, Council President Goodhouse. 
my question is, they're, if they're talking to the business community and looking at tweaking the amount, so obviously there's some way that they have some play in it or they can change it or they can do something. So I think at least singling a message to them, I don't know what parts they can change right now, especially if it gets appealed and they have to rewrite it, then obviously they could take that into account or they could look at maybe pulling it and going the next cycle. But I, I think some kind of letter in some form so they at least say, hey, you know, in writing this is what's wrong. Councillor Anderson, can you live with that? Councillor Lube? Well, you, what are your alternatives? I mean, are you going to present something different? I mean, they, they tried a lot of, I mean, property tax isn't going to work. Um, you know, this payroll tax, they ha they've had their staff working on this for, you know, nine months, and, and this is the best they came up with. If, if, we, if we can come up with kind of an alternative, I think that would be worth it. Um, well, how about how about one alternative would be that they they request that all the agencies that have been partners in this project agree to voluntarily pay the payroll tax. That'd be a start. Um, Agree. Yeah, I, I don't think they'd have any. Um, well, I, I think it was wasn't it wasn't it a law wasn't a state law that they could not do that. They couldn't compel them to, but they can ask them to volunteer. I mean, this yeah. is where the lack of creativity, I just found this to be a profound lack of creativity in problem solving. Like, okay, you can't tax them, you can't force them to pay it, but like every one of these entities has been at the table talking about all these projects. Everybody's going to benefit from it. You know, okay, so you can't compel them, you can still ask them to. I don't think they can uh, bond off a of voluntary um, contribution. Maybe not. I mean, it, there are problems to work out. The point is they didn't do anything to try to solve that problem, though. No, because it pulled well. Well, the, the government, the tax of the government agencies, didn't, they didn't find that out until about three days before. Metro's legal. It was almost like three days before they referred it they found out that so they were planning on taxing the government agency so that's that didn't fall into the polling or anything with the government agencies right well that that was that wasn't a question to the to the residents anyway but uh you're right you're right that they found that out late in the game and and then that would have polled terrible i mean we i, I would have loved to see the data but if they said you know should should you exclude public employee payroll I mean that would have pulled terribly yeah just because it's yeah, not right. yeah. <clears throat> okay so what I'm hearing <laughs> uh, really quick Councillor Newton again I also um, think that uh, a couple of you have said something about spreading it a little and I was surprised I mean I know it doesn't pull well but the vehicle registration and, and gas tax because it seemed to me that, you know, as Councillor Anderson, I think, said, it is a transportation measure, and um, I don't know, I think spreading it out a little might make it more palatable to the business community. That's just my thought. But. Well, certainly, well, certainly having, having other people uh, bearing the cost besides just business uh, would, to Councillor Newton, whether it's, you know, a, like I think, if you want to balance it and you don't want to do one of those things, then you have it be a 50-50 employee-employer payroll tax, which I'm sure also didn't pull as well as just an employer-paid <laughs> payroll tax. I mean, yeah. that's kind of like not complicated to figure out. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm also not hearing all of you saying, yes, let's send a letter right now. This is what it should say. I'm not getting that from everybody. Am I... Am I missing the room? Should we just let this lie and see what happens? Yeah, I don't think we know yet. You know, I, 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 I just, I, I just don't think we have enough uh, cohesion on what the letter would say or what it's trying to accomplish. And especially with them looking at potentially trying to change the measure or the percentage, I just, we don't know what we're exactly sending a letter on. So I'm just, I'm not in favor of sending a letter yet. Oh, on TV. Okay. Unless, well, Mary, you want to maybe dress it up and then send it to people and see if that's, I mean, if you want to put together what you've heard from everyone and see if it might be, you could put some kind of letter together that would at least convey the message and then people could decide on that if they want to send it or not. Yeah, I mean, I'm not hearing support to even do that. So I'm, okay. I'm not, I, I, I've, 
I've whispered uh, into Lynn Peterson's ears, and she can either take it or leave it for now, and then, you know, we'll make a further decision down the line once um, some of it becomes more clear. Uh, a couple other topics. Sorry, that one was so long, but um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a legislative update that, uh, and now I guess it's happened, but the the legislative session um, really ended up being, th there were a lot of ideas floated that included more than just COVID and money, but it ended up becoming, I think, just about COVID and both relief and how to balance the budget. So that's what ended up happening. Anything more on public safety reform is going to be punted to either a future session or to the, the regular session next uh next winter and spring um so that's kind of how that that's what's ended up on the legislative front uh the last thing i want to just brief you guys on is that um you know we've had a number of individuals respond in a pretty challenging way to the statements about uh both the transformation commission and the um, the the assertion that there's any kind of systemic or institutional racism in Tigard or any kind of racism at all in Tigard. Um, and what has struck me in those conversations, and I guess I want to share with all of you, is that um, when I read them, they're coming from a profound place of just completely not understanding what systemic racism is or even what racism is um, just you can tell that by the context and the content that's included in the communication and so I am putting to and I just I want all of you to know this because you're probably going to get questions and I also think that you should pro once I describe the letter that we're drafting um, it's going to have a couple resources in it including a suggested book to read and then two video links that uh, just are um, very timely. One of them is on the, and they both were presented at the Oregon Mayor's Association conference, but we're going to edit them down. Um, one of them is on just the history of racism in Oregon, which is really interesting. And I would encourage all of you, like everyone to watch that video. Um, and then the second one is um, from the National League of Cities uh, their their director on the um, basically their programs to eliminate uh, racism in cities or, or throughout the country, but Drew using the city platform. Um, Leon Andrews is his name. He's the director of that program, and he gave one of the most interesting and compelling talks I've ever heard uh, on any topic. And I would encourage. You know, I would encourage you all, if you haven't read the book, you certainly haven't seen these videos because they just came out on last Thursday and Friday, and you're also not going to the Oregon Mayor's Association conference, but I would encourage all of you to um, watch the two videos, and if you haven't read the book, to consider reading the book. But I'm, I'm going to be responding to folks with, um, with this kind of information to really hopefully uh, at least invite them to participate in uh, more of a learning and uh, hopefully a willingness to understand what we're even talking about. Um, so I hope you're all okay with that. I just am not, I'm not okay with the silence and I'm not okay with just letting, you know, letting them uh, write these things. One, one of the people was criticizing the quality of the example I provided about the chalk the sidewalk chalk incident, um, and what I what we have to explain to that person is that that's the best example I have received that I have permission to share. That doesn't mean that that's the best example. There are a bunch of much better examples, but those individuals have not given me permission to share them, and that's their own private business. Like I, I'm not going to share something that someone asked to keep in confidence. So. I, and now we have a, an even more uh, dramatic example that um, I think we'll all be hearing about 
in the next, uh, well, we'll I, I want to talk about how we might do that too. But we, the city manager, Chief McAlpine, and I all had a meeting with a resident who um, is very well informed and actually works at the city of Beaverton and reports directly to Mayor Doyle. Um, and he told a very compelling story that just happened in the last two weeks in Tigard. Um, it didn't involve, uh, you know, any city staff necessarily uh, in a way that was a problem, but it was um, it was really compelling. And it has to do with housing uh, and uh, noise complaints. And uh, just at the end, let me just share the end of it. Um, there was no noise complaint coming from this person's location. There was a party behind them uh, at a different house, um, but they they got the you know the call into their neighborhood, and uh, the our police department handled it very well, um, and just sort of thanked them and said goodbye. We got a second call for a noise complaint later, and the officers, based on the prior interaction, declined to even respond. Um, but that, that's all kind of like, okay, that's pretty, I mean, it's, it's not totally benign, but it's not super dramatic. Um, and I, I guess I should also share that these folks had put a, um, a Black Lives Matter sign in their yard a couple weeks before this all started. And the, you know, a, a couple of the renters at this rental house, uh, are, um, are black and so they put a Black Lives Matter sign up. This happens, but this is the kicker. The person who'd made the complaint to the police didn't, didn't leave it at that. And even though the, the police response was totally unfounded, um, this individual took it upon themselves to figure out who the rental agency was for the tenant, called the rental agency, and complained about them. And they then got a warning letter saying that if they have another another interaction, they'll be fined by the rental agency, and if they have one more from that, they'll be kicked out. And to have an individual call, I mean, that is, that is, there is no other way to interpret that other than I want you out of my neighborhood. There's more to the story, and I won't, I'm not going to share all, you know, I we don't have time to share all of it. It was an hour and 30 minute meeting, but I want you to have a sense of, you know, what some of the kinds of things that are going on in our community really look like. Um, and that's a story that we do have permission to tell now. And I will sum this up by saying that, um, and I want to get your feedback on this, is I am considering as a, in addition to that kind of a response letter that's got the, the two videos and the book suggestion, I am considering whether we want to um, maybe partner with a with the appropriate community group to have a storytelling uh, session that includes that that gentleman has already agreed to participate in a storytelling session, and I think we could easily get a couple more. I don't think like we should be moderating it. I think that it needs to be carefully handled. Um, but would you all think that that would be a good like doing that kind of a storytelling uh, session with people that are really experiencing these things in the city of Tigard would be valuable? Sure. Yes, I, 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 yeah, I love that. I think that uh, last week, the week before, echoes what I was kind of saying. The more we can get on social media to show these examples, I think people that, that don't experience this, don't see it, don't realize this happens. And if we don't provide links and books and videos or even real life experiences to show that it does happen here in Tigard, um, then we can't we can't fix what's going on until we actually people understand what is happening. I think right, it's, it's important. Like the, the first step in this twelve step program. Sorry, Councillor Newton. That's yeah, fine. I think, <laughs> I think it's important because I read a lot. I didn't get through everything. Most of the pages on the comments, but it responds to folks who question whether or not there are those kinds of incidents and folks are experiencing that here in Tigard. And I think it's important, to, I think that's a good idea. I really think it's important if people are willing to 
you know, engage in a session like that, I think it would, you know, would help people to understand, yes, there are issues here. And I know there are other issues. I've heard of people, a couple of people who went to rent an apartment and um, they were told there were no units after they had looked online and saw there were. So they drove around for a little while, called a half an hour later, the same place, and they told them about all these vacancies. But when they went in person, they were told there were no vacancies. And that was in the last year. So Wow. So, Youth Councilor Calderon, I'm particularly interested in your perspective on this. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that not only would it be important to people who deny racism, but also to the people who experience it to know that they're not alone. Because I know that in my life, uh, as a person of color, I have experienced racism, but um, I haven't experienced it very recently, but I would be very interested in seeing other people's stories. And I think it would be almost empowering to others to hear other people's stories to know that they're not alone and that everyone, that we can deal with this and that uh yeah that we can deal with it and um uh, it is a hopefully manageable problem that we can help uh, educate others on about why it's such an issue well and inaction is not an option it's just not and i don't know how we are on time are we do we have to cut out 10 minutes before um, yeah we got about three minutes what do you okay. got so what i wanted to add to it um and, and this has been said enough times that I can, I can share the story, but it's not only what actually happens, but it's the fear that people of color live with. Um, okay. Twice now I've heard the uh, CEO um, of NLC, Clarence Anthony, tell a story that whenever, um, for example, if he gets on an elevator and a white person gets on there, he, he's afraid, he's fearfully afraid. He, he's a well-educated, um, high earner, president of a national league of cities but all it takes for is that person in the elevator to say this person did something to me on the elevator and the way that the system set up in a, in a way is for them to come back and say and believe that person and he loses his career his reputation his earnings he loses everything so it, it's not only that but there's also a different world that people of color have to live in that they have this fear that hey if i do something that the average person does I, will, I might go to jail, I might lose my livelihood, I might have my family turn against me, and, and that's why I don't think people understand too. And so we start pointing out some of these things happen, and these are understanding what people of color go through every day. They're afraid if they do something wrong, if they, if they get something's perceived wrong. If they're alone with someone, there's no cameras or there's no witnesses, then it's one word against the other one, and, and in the culture it is, a lot of times the other person is believed over the person of color. Councilor Lube, you wanted to Sorry, Council President Goodhouse, I want to give Councilor Lube an opportunity to speak. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I did get through all of the, the 38 pages of the feedback, and I think one of the most frustrating parts is um, just the denial because they haven't seen something. And I think it's fundamentally important that, you know, we educate people that simply your experience is not... Um, the universal experience of everyone in your community and that we can experience each other um, very differently depending upon who you're interacting with. Um, and these stories are really important so people understand and can see that it does happen here because it does. Mayor, the, the story you're talking about, I, I read all about it on Nextdoor and it's heartbreaking and frustrating. Um, and it's something that we need to address on a very public level to bring that education and understanding that this is also that something that's unacceptable in Tigard. Um, we're pushing to be a welcoming community for everyone, and, and that means that everyone needs to feel comfortable in their homes and, and not have this sort of um, racism and behavior pointed at them. And so, you know, these stories are, are ways of doing it for people who are comfortable sharing those stories because much like you, you know, I've heard other stories as well and they're just, they're heartbreaking. Um, and people just need to understand that even though they don't experience it, it doesn't mean someone else does not have a different experience, even interacting with the same people. All right, so I want, we, we're at time. Uh, Assistant City Manager Nyland, I assume you've been tracking this conversation and can take this as an action point that in the next, four to six weeks we need to put this type of a session together we need to partner with the right group to um, probably host it because it's not appropriate or 
Uh, we're not the best people necessarily to be facilitating it but and or even designing it, but we need to quickly put together a, a community-wide listening session that is broadcast for everyone to see. Yep, Can I I've, a, take, I've taken notes and we'll make that happen. And a quick five-second comment. I don't know if this is even possible, but if we even were able to do a turn that, that story into a minute video that can be put on social media, just that they explained and show it and kind of do something where people could quickly capture that experience in some kind of a video, if we can get a um, production or, or someone to put something together on that. Yeah, that was that was part of the consideration too, Council President Goodhouse. We've, we've been talking about that with staff um, and, and that probably would come after the storytelling event, having some video vignettes that are, you know, a short type of thing. Yes, we probably need that too. All right, uh, Mr. Nullup, I hope we've given you enough time. You got eight minutes. We'll make it happen. Thank you very much. We're, we are recessed until 7.30.
Deputy City Recorder Patton, please call roll. Councillor Anderson? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Here. Youth Councillor Calderon? Here. Council President Goodhouse? Here. Councillor Here. Newton? Here. And Councillor Loom? Here. All right. Uh, will you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance silently? Please mute yourselves. to any uh, counselor staff have any non-agenda items all right we'll move on to public comments uh, written comment was due by 4 30 p.m. today uh, and you may also call in with questions um, for any of the agenda items the public comment process is displayed on the screen. Call in to 503-966-4101. And uh, Deputy City Recorder Patton, there were no written public comments, correct? That is correct. All right. So we will move on to follow up to previous public comment. Assistant City Manager Nyland, is there any? Nope, we do not have any follow-up items for this evening. All right. Uh, Police Chief McAlpine, your update, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Again, Police Chief Kathy McAlpine. Here, let me get it. Sorry, get the video going. Um, as you know, this is the July uh, executive dashboard, and hopefully this time they all you all received a copy timely and we can go through this uh, the ones that I want to highlight I, first just overall the dashboard has changed the layout and this will be the month that illustrates those new layout and I will get to that in just a moment first uh, the biggest increase or the thing I want to draw to your attention is dispatch calls this is the first time since we've been in the pandemic that our calls for service um, exceeded last month's or last year's um, statistics. Uh, where we're seeing again is, and this is also the first time that we've had 70% of our calls in societal type um, efforts. Uh, still a lot of uh, some of our known individuals with mental health issues um, are draining our resources quite a bit, calling in anywhere from two to 10 times a day for various issues uh, that are being documented that we are trying to um, get this person into services um, but right now um, they're free to to call us at their whim uh, the other thing I want to draw attention to is we now have intersection speed uh, this went live where we're actually issuing citations July 14th and so uh, we have received almost 800 actual violations um, during this time and as you can imagine that has been a big uh, heavy lift on our officers to review those and um, determine if they're in fact violations uh, we were, were able to get through that and and that's just about a half a month's worth of work is 800 you can see the majority of them are long 99 and 70 second and and the other I uh, want to just draw attention to is the employee snapshot so we now have incorporated the levy funding positions and the one increase uh, into this year's budget so you'll now see uh, increased budget number that we'll be monitoring next slide please and then we've what we've added is uh, page three we've changed that to really 
uh, start tracking the levy status. So again, hoping that it uh, gives all of you uh, a snapshot month to month as well as our community members on how we're um, doing in those areas. Again, under COVID and the uh, pandemic, we're not able to get our training in our training room. So we, we don't have any results there. Um, but then we do how we're progressing with our patrol officers, the school resource officer, as you imagine, once that's in limbo, but two, we weren't planning on adding that person until we, we actually added uh, the other eight officers. And then of course, eventually our non-sworn support staff. We also wanted to let you know how, how many individuals were processing through. We just started with July, even though we were doing many more because we had uh, three vacancies from the general fund. We want to just show you where we're at with interviews, our physical fitness test background and conditional offers. We do have two conditional officers, offers and one higher uh, in the month of July. And I'd be happy to announce one entry level and one lateral officer from Hawaii who speaks uh, fluent Spanish and we're excited to uh, welcome her and swear her in around the, the first week of September. And then again, we one of our metrics was, are we able to, once we get more officers on the street, decrease our priority one or two response times? And then are we able to then staff with five police districts and have district integrity with the first focus is on swing shift, knowing that that is our highest call volume hours. And so we'll be able to track that as well. Uh, next slide, please. And last, the, the other uh, big uh, thing we've unveiled is our transparency page. And you know there are many reasons, obviously, given the national narrative, but also um, we think it's important to let our community know how we measure up. Uh, and so what you might find on this page is three sections. <coughs> uh, one is any updates from myself. Also, uh, the dashboard. So once we've presented the, I've presented the dashboard to you, it will be on our website the next morning on our transparency page. We will also have stop or uh, data, which is our traffic stops and person stops. We have a year's worth of data on that, and then our use of force. And then we'll continue to add more to that. And then, Mike, if you could play that clip, that is the intro to the transparency page. I'm Kathy McAlpine. As Tigers Police Chief, I want to address the senseless murder of George. I'm Kathy. As Tigers Police Chief, I want to address the senseless murder of George Floyd. I was shocked and appalled by what I witnessed in that video, and I know the actions of those few officers. Give me one second to see if we can fix the sound issue with this. Hold on one second, please. Chief, while he's working on that, um, I just want to acknowledge the very profound uh, volume of, of uh, citations at 70 second for speed. Um, that seems really dramatic. Um, and what's interesting to me about it is, you know, we've had three, I think, pedestrian deaths within a block of that intersection in the last five years, and um, I guess we're starting to see why. I don't know if you have anything else to say about that. Well, it's um, uh, the highest speed that I've been told so far we've recorded there is 74 miles per hour, and that's a 35 mile per hour zone. So you have people pretty much disregarding the sp posted speed limit there. And then um, other issues we've noticed is somebody coming maybe to and from uh, traveling northbound one way, speeding, comes back an hour and a half later, speeding, going the other way. Uh, we've seen somebody, the same car that uh, looks like maybe going to work and has received four citations. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, some pretty blatant driving patterns that we're seeing. And Chief, uh, the flow. And I'll just. 
Go ahead. It just doesn't look like the video is going to work, and I don't want to delay it because I know there's a lot on the agenda. But again, for all of you and the people viewing, especially maybe those who are uh, tuning in on the Transformational Commission, is it's just um, the website is there to acknowledge and provide a one-stop shop for our community members who would like to um, stay further engaged, also see the data, and we're hoping that we um, receive some feedback. Uh, it's always fluid and we can make changes or put other information. They'll be able to click to all of our policies. Um, I would imagine the community for all will also do this as far as um, uh, things that the transformation mission does. Yeah, it's, uh, I, we've gotten very positive feedback already, Chief, about that. So about just the the transparency page. I know. I know you announced it last week at the at your chat with the chief, and the following night, I was getting quite a bit of positive feedback about it. So, Council President Goodhouse, did you have a statement you wanted to make? Or I, I just wanted a follow up question. It was good to know that the um, the highest speed recorded was 74 miles an hour. What do you do? You have any um, data as far as what the average um, speed over the speed limit is, or what the average speed of the tickets are? I'm I'm kind of curious of what it. If it's really a 20 or 30 or what kind of the average speed over the speed limit is? Uh, generally, it's been about in the uh, 14, 15 mile per hour range. And you know, by statute, it uh, has to be at least 11 miles per hour over. Okay. So if you're on so mute. That's, that's essentially 49 to 50 miles an hour speed in that 35 zone? Correct. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, and, uh, and then um, if you have any uh, thoughts later when you get a little more comfortable with the levy page, always looking to see if that uh, pleases your eye and um, as we uh, continue to add data there and provide updates, um, we can tweak it any way that we want. So. I know you've seen it for the first time, so I'll give you a chance to take a look at that and look later on, take any suggestions you may have. And that's all I have. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions or comments from the rest of the council? Mr. Mayor, it's Councilor Newton. I just wanted to compliment you, Chief. I know we've had a lot of feedback, but I, I took a look at the um, transparency page and I thought it was a good mix of data and responses to questions that we're getting out in the community. I think the message from you was good. So I really appreciated the mix of information. You know, you had data, you had responses to questions that we're hearing out there. So I just wanted to compliment you on that uh, page. I took a good hard, a uh, good deep look at it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And I think the other thing that helps us is both our public information officer and our community engagement officer um, help create that and that's with an eye of a, of a civilian and so this is not heavy police speak or uh, they really can inform me that this is not full of jargon that this has meaning and I think that makes it far more uh, impactful as well all right thank you chief excellent work um, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is to get an update from the Tigard Area Chamber of Commerce and uh, Market Manager Love. Are you available? Hello. Uh, thank you all. Hello, Jessica Love, uh, Tigard Chamber of Commerce. I here to give you our update. Um, first off, we wanted to congratulate the Leadership Tiger Class of 2020. They have officially graduated from the program. We're so excited. And thank you, Mayor Snyder, for speaking at the uh, graduation ceremony. We greatly appreciate it. And then we are now accepting applications for the Class of 2020-21. Uh, we are hosting a program called Telework, Teleschool, Telewhat. And it is basically what we are going to be talking about is the challenges and opportunities that employers, businesses, and educators are going to be faced during this time of online schooling. And that is going to be August 19th at 9 a.m. We are hosting a local uh, Eat Local Night, which is going to be August 18th from 5 to 8 p.m. And this is where we are encouraging community members to go out and support our local restaurants. And this month's highlight is Beach Hut Deli in downtown Tigard. 
And so we are encouraging people to, however they feel comfortable, either dining in, ordering to go, or um, you know, having it delivered, whatever they're comfortable with, just go and support Beach Hut Deli on August 18th from 5 to 8 p.m. Our candidate endorsement committee is just finishing up the process for the uh, city council endorsements, and we will be announcing the decisions soon. And then we are still in the process of going through the Metro Council endorsement program. <laughs> and then um, we will be starting in September a new webinar series where it's going to be educational topics. And September's topic is going to be called Cash is King. And it's going to be on budget planning and forecasting. And this is going to be a free program uh, available for all business professionals. And then we want to announce our high school scholarship recipients, which is Lukta, Maria Delgado, and Teddy Bronx. They will be recognized at our special scholarship award ceremony, and that will be online August 26th at 3 p.m. We host our annual networking every Thursday at 8 a.m. And then we have South Metro Young Professionals hosting a staycation social hour on August 27th. And then we also have our affinity groups coming up, and we encourage everyone to check out our calendar for upcoming programs. For the farmer's market, we are halfway through the season. I can't believe it. It's going by so quickly. And we have new vendors joining continuously. And then the market is in transition of a new layout that will most likely be implemented this Sunday. And it will be including half of Tiger Street, the Tiger Street public parking lot, and then also Rotary Plaza. And then for Downtown Tigard, we, uh, the art walk that I've mentioned, or the art scavenger hunt that I've mentioned in the past, has been uh, moved to the end of August. And then the TDA is currently discussing trick-or-treat Main Street and holiday tree lighting and how that may look for this upcoming year. And then we are also looking at ways to showcase commercial vacancies to recruit new businesses to Downtown Tigard. Does anybody have any questions I can answer? Well, I, Jessica, I just want to make a comment and make sure the council knows that we are going to try to um, get on the schedule to host Good Morning Tigard. And actually, Councilor Lube was the one who re-raised the fact that we haven't done this in about a year and some change. And so I think we're tentatively looking at, I uh, think, September 10th. Is that right? I'm pretty um, sure that was the date, yes. OK. So we look forward to that. Uh, and, and we're going to, my plan, and Council, you can give input on this if you want, my thought was that we, given everything that we've been through as a community and as a business community, that it would make sense for us to be going into that session and use our 10 minutes as host to listen instead of talk. So I wondered if you were all supportive of that. Okay. Sorry, Jessica, I'm kind of okay. uh, taking this sideways. But uh, count, any members of council have questions or comments for uh, Ms. Love? Okay, thank you. Perfect. Good to thank see you. you. Nice to see you all. All right, we'll move on to item number D, summary of written public comment. We received none, and the city recorder confirmed that earlier. Uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is phone in public comment. Mr. Nolup, do we have any callers in the queue? Uh, Mr. Mayor, at this time, there are no callers in the queue. Okay. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Consent agenda is used for routine items, including receipt of council meeting calendars and approval of contracts or intergovernmental agreements. Information on each item is available on the city's website in the packet for this meeting. These items may be enacted in one motion without separate discussion. Council members may request that an item be removed by motion for discussion and separate action. Tonight we have consideration of an intergovernmental agreement for a water intertie feasibility study with the City of Beaverton and Tualatin Valley Water District. And uh, that is it. Is there a motion or discussion? Mayor, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Councilor Lou Balkan. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. City Recorder, please conduct a roll call vote. Councillor Anderson? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Council President Goodhouse? Yes. Councillor Newton? 
Yes. And Councillor Lou. Yes. Okay, the consent agenda is adopted unanimously. We'll now uh, convene as the local contract review board for the next agenda item. Uh, is item number five, contract award for tier one and two, information technology help desk support to bridge tech. Uh, we have Purchasing Manager Moody and IT Manager Nolup. Good evening, Mayor Schneider and Councilors. I'm Christine Moody, Purchasing Manager. We are here tonight asking for your approval to award a contract to Bridge Tech LLC for Tier 1 and 2 IT Help Desk support in the amount of $750,000. In May of this year, the city issued a request for proposal for IT help desk services, and we received three responses. As a minimum requirement of the RFP, we asked firms to have proven experience in supporting 300 plus user environments and have the ability to respond on site to a service request within 30 minutes. Staff then reviewed and scored the responses based upon the evaluation criteria of technical ex experience, firm and team qualifications and cost structure. Two firms were then asked to further clarify their proposed services and the selection committee concluded that Bridge Tech was the highest ranked proposal and the best contractor to perform this work. I will now turn this over to Mike Nolop, Information Technology Manager, to tell you a little bit more about the services that be, are being provided. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and the Council. Um, so. Tier one and tier two help desk uh, are your are your most basic, most frequent help desk uh, type of tickets that come in. So this could be password resets or my Outlook isn't working correctly. Um, it's more standard. So what we have found, and we went into this uh, a little over a year ago and said, hey, we we need got a lot of pressure in the IT uh, world. With a lot of projects. We've got over seventy projects in our IT queue. Uh, we have 4,000 tickets a year. We have a staff of five people. We had a vacancy. Um, so what can we do to get creative to allow us maybe a little relief from that pressure? So uh, we went into a proof of concept um, with Bridge Tech to see, hey, maybe managed services is a way to go and, and we'll give our organization some some relief that is, is needed and helps us focus. Um, this was successful. Um, it was started off just like hiring a new employee, right? You have to train them on your systems and your processes and procedures. Um, you know, for the first four, four months probably, it's just like a new employee. Um, after that, we really started seeing the efficiencies of this uh, proof of concept kick in where uh, City of Tiger and IT staff didn't have to field the constant daily calls and Bridge Tech was self-sufficient and could take over. Um, one thing to note is the service hours that Bridge Tech has proposed is uh, that of equal of almost two FTEs uh, it would take us to fill. Uh, and there's no vacations or no illness that we have to take account. This is a team approach uh, that this group brings to our to Tigard. Um, so it really is nice because uh, in the past when someone would go on vacation for a week, somebody else has to, to, to fill in and, and take up that gap and we lose momentum on the projects or the work that they're doing. So uh, we found that uh, we've got increased efficiencies and we can tackle more uh, IT and departmental projects. We can focus more on the security tasks uh, and we, not that it's a bother to do the daily tasks over and over again, but uh, I, I will tell you that um, it's been a really nice relief to, to have somebody else to be able to feel those first things and, and really our team can step in when it needs to get escalated. Um, so at this point in time, uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, about the process or the work that's being done by Bridge Tech or any of uh, the information that was given to you guys. Mr. Nullup, the $750,000 clearly, um, I think the, any member of the public that's watching would want to know how long of a contract this covers. If it's two FTEs, certainly two IT FTEs doesn't cost 750000 in one year. So can you maybe get, and, and I'm sure we're getting better coverage, but can you talk through that just to kind of explain the, the value proposition here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, uh, you know, I have a hard time reading the IT crystal ball for three years from now, let alone five years from now. Um, the 750000 covers a five-year contract. Um, we're writing it as a three-year contract with 
an option to extend for two additional years. Um, so this is, it ends up being uh, roughly about 140,000 per year. Well, that sounds like a bargain. It, it actually, uh, yeah, it's, this is public, but Bridge Tech can watch, but yes, it is, it is a great deal and a great value. Um, you know, we, we have found some incredible efficiencies. Uh, we, the best part about this is we've, we've determined, uh, Bridge Tech's the incumbent. They're the ones that did the, the proof of concept. So there's no change to staff. Um, they're an incredible business partner. Um, they help us out. They're also a, uh, uh, a contract of our vendor for our on, uh, on call uh, IT support services. So they can actually even with a different contract escalate it up if, if just say the network crashes or anything like that. So uh, it's, it's a very valuable business partner to us and they're very flexible and accommodating to our needs. Um, it's, it's been a great program. Excellent. Any council have questions or is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, I have a quick question. Uh, Mr. Nolop, I note that um, with approval of this contract, the city will eliminate a computer support technical position. And I assume that's a budgeted position, but it's not currently filled. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, so that is uh, the funds we've been using uh, from that position is what it allowed us to do the proof of concept. It's what it's allowing us to fund this contract. Um, so it, uh, I don't want to get rid of an FTE because I know they're hard to get back until we have that signed piece of paper in the contract, but you should see that adjustment in the Q1 supplemental. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions or a motion? Uh, Council President Goodhouse, I move to approve the contract award for Tier 1 and 2 IT Help Desk Support to Bridge Tech LLC. Councilor Newton, I second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. City Recorder, roll call vote, please. Director Anderson? Yes. Chair Snyder? Yes. Director Goodhouse? Yes. Director Newton? Yes. And Director Lube? Yes. Okay, the contract award to Bridge Tech LLC is adopted unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Nolop. Thank you. And I think the mayor has frozen. I, I think he has. We'll uh, pause for a quick second and allow him to reconnect. Or blink. The mayor said he's currently logging back in, um, so he should be back with us in a moment. Mr. Mayor, welcome back. Mr. Nolop, can you hear me? I can. You're ready to All go. right. 
So this happened during the, the all staff meeting too. Uh, Mr. Nullip, I guess this will be my quick way of saying, I think we need to deal with my, the, my five-year-old city device because it's crashing. And this is, I think, just a RAM and resource problem. So um, the sooner the better on that. But that can be a side thing, but I don't want to forget to tell you. So there you go. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to the informational public hearing, uh, city manager recruitment process. I am gonna open the public hearing. Uh, HR Director Bennett, staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Dana Bennett, Human Resources Director, City of Tiger. As you are aware, City Manager Wine has provided notice that she will not be renewing her contract, which expires November 30th of, the, of this year. I'm here tonight to discuss the hiring standards and selection criteria that will be used in designing a recruitment process for a new city manager. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to gather council input and direction uh, of the process and allow an opportunity for public comment. I'm going to cover some key staff or key facts first. Um, First, uh, briefly, hiring standards and selection criteria are outlined on the city manager class specification, which was uh, attached to the staff report. The minimum qualifications include a bachelor's degree or equivalent and 10 years of related experience, including at least five leading staff. Um, in addition, I'm going to highlight some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are on that class specification. I won't go into all of them, but a couple of key ones that I think are important, knowledge of municipal funding development. Or, uh, sorry, knowledge of municipal budget development, administration and accountability, knowledge of principles and practices, legal elements of economic and community development and redevelopment, knowledge of administrative principles and practices, including goal setting, program development, implementation and evaluation and supervision of staff and leadership of staff, ability to work cooperatively um, and provide staff support and implementation of policies of the policies of city council, ability to develop and implement goals and objectives, policies and procedures and work standards for internal controls, ability to oversee city financial activities, including administrative, um, administering investments and development and implementation of city budget and controls and expenditures and purchases, um, apply and interpret um, compliance, uh, sorry, interpret, apply and ensure compliance with federal, state and local guidelines, conduct effective negotiations and effectively represent the city in meetings of, with other governmental agencies, community groups, and various professional, educational, and regulatory groups, analyze, uh, analyze problems, identify alternative solutions, uh, project consequences of proposed actions, and implement recommendations to support goals, ability to use sound independent judgment within general legal po and policy and procedural guidelines, and ability to use tact, initiative, prudence, and independent judgment with general, within general policies, procedures, and legal guidelines. Staff believe this existing class spec appropriately captures the qualifications needed for the role of city manager, but we're open to input and suggestions for change, either from council or from the community as part of this meeting. In addition to the class spec, the other area we'd like to cover is hiring policy directives, uh, which are also open for discussion and input. Staff recommend the use of an executive search firm um, for their expertise and assistance. A draft scope of work is attached uh, for consideration and input as well. I'll do just a quick overview of what's in that scope. Um, development of a process timeline by the, recruit by the recruiting firm. Uh, building of a candidate profile. Design and selection of the actual process. This would include interviews, uh, meet and greets, candidate presentations, etc an advertising outreach plan, an evaluation and screening of applications process, um, an assistance and coordination with holding the final selection process, and then uh, assistance with a background and reference check, and then final offer and contract negotiations with a finalist. So that's an outline of what we would recommend uh, as part of a scope of work that we would send out to a recruitment firm. Uh, staff also recommend that council consider an interim appointment to ensure continuity of city operations as the process of selecting and hiring a new city manager may extend beyond the notice provided by manager Wine. A brief process overview of what would happen between here and um, getting a, an executive firm um, online would include a development of scope of work, which we've already drafted, which will need to be finalized. 
Uh, we build that into then an informal request for proposal process. We would then uh, receive uh, formal bids. We would evaluate them, select a finalist, and then finalize a contract with a search firm. So those would be the steps. Um, at this point, I think it would be important to hear if there is any public input and if council has any um, comments on what's being proposed. Yeah, so uh, we're in the middle of a public hearing. I know city manager, or city manager, um, HR director Bennett, you're maybe don't do these all the time, but I don't want the council to go there yet. So I'm gonna kind of intervene. Um, the steps in the public hearing involve getting testimony from the public now. So uh, Deputy City Recorder Patton, we did not have any written public testimony, correct? Yes, Mr. Mayor, topic. you're correct. There was no written testimony. All right, uh, Mr. Nullup, do we have any callers in the queue for phone in? Uh, Mr. Mayor, there are no callers in the queue. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bennett, I assume that means you don't have any response to testimony. So I will close the public hearing and we will move on to council discussion on city manager recruitment process. And uh, let's, uh, and, and questions. So it's both discussion and questions if you have them. Let's start with uh, Councilor Anderson. Uh, evening, Dana. Um, how have we used these uh, recru recruitment firms in the past? So we used them, um, the last time we used one was for the police chief process. And the uh, scope of work that I've outlined is largely in line with what we did for the police chief process. That was a process that had a lot of community input involved in it. Okay. Did we use one for the library director or no? Um, no, we did the library director as well as the last two assistant city managers as internal recruitment processes managed by my staff. Um, one of the reasons we used a, an executive for search firm for the police chief in particular was um, about the recruitment access list. So it's really about the um, advertising, campaigning, and outreach that an executive search firm can do. And we feel like the city manager is at a level that the city would benefit from that. Okay, I agree. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Okay, so we'll go to Councillor Newton. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. First of all, I agree an executive search firm is important, having, having gone through it a few times myself, being on staff there. And I think you're right, they can do a lot more targeted outreach and get um, candidates that might match our profile. I guess I will say one thing, and, and maybe we can talk about it later. Um, well, two things. First of all, I think it would be important to, and I'd be happy to volunteer unless somebody else wants to do it, to have a city councilor engaged along the process because I think there's some um, things that we want to make sure we cover in terms of engagement and communication that um, we want to make sure get covered in terms of communicating what the council might be looking for in a city manager. Um, you know, we, we are in times where communication is a lot more complicated. We're fortunate in that our um, community is very comfortable with engaging with our council. And when I was make, I've said this many times, making calls on the levy, I got a lot of compliments that how, uh, and how approachable we were. This is a good thing. However, I know that our staff is getting slammed with um, inquiries and uh, um, for the council, and then we've got some processes that move pretty quickly. So I think it might be important to make sure that um, that we're communicating uh, the the interests that we have moving forward in the communication area. So I don't know what that looks like in terms of recruitment. Um, all of these qualifications that we've got in the class spec, I think hit the nail on the head. But I, but I do think we're in a time with um, social equity and COVID and a lot of different things going on where, where we wanna make sure that we um, get someone who 
who who can focus on a lot on that communication element. So that's my opinion. My colleagues may not agree, but I think we we want to look at that as well. So thanks, well, Councillor Newton. There there are, there are three areas that I, in particular that I think. Uh, Director Bennett is looking for direction on, and you've hit the nail on the head with one of them, which is what amount of uh, sort of involvement do the council want to have, and does the council want to designate one or two individuals to represent the entire council through the process? So that's I'm going to, as a facilitation moment here, I'm going to I'm going to refresh you on all three of them. So as councilors are commenting, they can hit these. So that's one. Another one is on the choice to use an executive search firm. Councillor Anderson, I think, already hit that in his comments. Um, and then uh, the third is the the potential appointment of an interim. So, uh, Councillor Anderson, since you you didn't get the comment on necessarily on all those, do you have any other comments? And then we'll come back to Councillor Newton. I guess my only comment would be for the interim would be, you know, we have an assistant city manager now, uh, Kathy Nyland, and I, I assume that she would take over those roles um, for the time being. Well, I think we'll have a discussion about that probably in executive session, but the, the question here would be about whether or not we need an interim. And so I, I know that's sort of a specific question, but I assume you would think we need an interim. Well, just in case, um, Director Bennett, uh, it looks like this search could take longer than November 30th. Is that correct? Yes. I think that's a very reasonable estimation that we would be looking at no one coming on board before January or February. Yeah. All right. Did we lose okay. Councillor Newton? No, I'm here. Down. I was I was muted, so I so I wouldn't cause feedback. Um, when I was the interim, it took four and a half months, but we actually gave Marty an extra um, two weeks. So uh, it took for I was the interim for five months. So I think four is you know a little tight. Um, so I think we should look at an interim, but we we were able to do it in four and a half months when I was interim. So, but I I think we might be in a little bit more challenging time with the with the social distancing and remote, all the remote things that we'll have to look at doing. So yeah, I, I would support at, at least identifying um, someone as, as to serve as the interim. Youth Councilor Calderon? Yeah, so I don't know as much about the hiring process, but um, it seems like an interim would probably be a good move because city manager role is a pretty important thing. and just having someone there in case anything were to happen that would be pretty important and I like Councilor Newton said I think it would be logical to have one or two uh, counselors helping with this uh, process in order to have council input immediately there already and we don't have to wait until every single council meeting to get uh, to give feedback or any updates do you want to learn more about the process by participating as well Sure, why not? That seems like I would I would have fun. Thanks for volunteering. Councillor Lube. Uh, see, Youth Councillor, you learn your lesson when you make suggestions like that and the mayor volunteers you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so as far as council involvement, I agree. I think um, one or two of us is really important to uh, keep the process engaged and, and keep the ball rolling so um, we're actively involved. Um, I think an executive search firm is a good idea. Um, this is one of the most important positions in the city, setting the tone and the direction. And it's something that it's critical for us to do right. And we have a lot of change coming and, and it's just, it's really important to find the right fit. And that executive search firm is gonna have those additional tools in order to broaden the search and look for um, the right person. Um, as far as an interim appointment, you know, the, again, the city manager role is very important, and I think it's um, critical to have one um, clear person who's in charge in the meantime in order to um, have that continuation just for everything that comes up and one chain of command. And so I, I would agree with appointing an interim as well. Thank you. Council President Goodhouse. 
Yes, uh, yeah, I'll go through the list. I, I, I think obviously uh, a search firm um, is definitely a, a important. So uh, yes on that one. Involvement, whether it be um, the whole entire council or a council member or two, um, I think that's important, plus having the community, um, some people from the community part of that process. And if we're looking for volunteers, I have no problem volunteering being part of that as one of the council members too, um, as far as being that process. But I think it definitely is important to have council members since we work so closely with the city manager to really know what we're looking for and wanting that that uh, position or the future person and uh, definitely have someone to take over in the interim um, we definitely need that I don't want to rush to decision or, or have that position not filled okay so I have heard Councillor Newton and Council President Goodhouse uh, volunteer and then Youth Councillor Calderon bar was voluntold by me um, that seems like plenty of representation from the council uh, on that. Can everybody, I, I don't think we have to vote on that, but does anyone object to that plan? Okay. Um, let's see, did we, I think we covered, I think we covered all the topics. I guess I didn't give my opinion necessarily, but I, I support the use of the executive search firm um, I think with what we need to accomplish, it's just the right way to move the process forward. I actually thought the police chief hiring process and the level of community involvement we had helped us get a better result. And I'd like to see a similar level of community involvement in this hiring. And, um, you know, I don't know that we can pull that off in the same way that uh, an executive search firm can. And the access to the applicants and having the networks necessary to to nail that so for those reasons I support it I think we need an interim identified sooner rather than later so that you know there can be an orderly and organized transition because um, I don't I just realistically I don't think we're going to have somebody hired uh, before city manager wine's last day I just don't think that's realistic um, so I think that I think that covers it. Uh, HR Director Bennett, anything else you didn't get that you feel like you need out of this conversation? No, I think I got the direction I was looking for. Um, just so that Council's aware, it is my expectation that as a search firm builds a candidate profile, they will reach out to each of you probably as individuals um, and have a discussion about what you're looking for. So I would expect that to happen. Um, and there are others we can put on that list as well and probably use some form of survey to get some of that data as well. So I'm yeah, we would, that... I, think, I think we would expect that to happen too. Okay, I just want to be clear about that. Great. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, we'll move on to Holy item host. number six. Item number seven on the agenda, discuss community input on the transformation Commission, uh, Assistant City Manager exiting. Nyland. Yes, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Kathy Nyland. I'm the Assistant City Manager, and I am going to introduce um, Kent Wyatt and Nicole Hendricks, who are going to talk about um, input we've received about the proposal for the Transformation Commission. I sent you um, an infographic over the weekend, as well as the raw data of um, comments we have received. Um, there's a lot of material there and I just want to, um, before they, they come online, um, just applaud these two and the supporting team for collecting all this information and getting a process in place. So on that note, um, Kent and Nicole, take it away. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'm Kent Wyatt, Communications Manager. Nicole Hendricks, Senior Manager Analyst, will join us in a second. Uh, tonight we want to recap really hit four points first recap what we heard from the community second seek input on whether refinements are needed to the proposal third outline how staff has been preparing for potential next steps of the commission and then finally seek direction from council for how we should advance the commission in a timely manner so as a little bit of background in early july council developed and refined a proposal for the transfer transformation commission starting on july 17th staff launched a comprehensive outreach strategy to gather community input on the proposal. So community members were asked to review the proposal and answer three main questions, which were, 
what they thought about the proposal, uh, was anything missing from it, how should commission members be selected, and what else should the city do to address racial injustice. So we gathered input from a number of areas, a couple I want to highlight just to have an idea of uh, where we sought to get feedback on this. Uh, a lot of our traditional channels, our 23,000 Cityscape subscribers, our 6,900 Facebook followers, uh, but we also personalized the, the outreach more. Uh, as you heard a little bit earlier, Mayor Snyder attended the all staff meeting, with, uh, over 200 employees were at that. Uh, we used, so since the beginning of, uh, or the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, we have been tracking um, anybody and everybody who submitted a comment to the city about what we should do as next steps. Uh, close to 140 of those individuals, we reached out to them to get feedback on it. Our community roundtable, which many of you have heard of, which is our, uh, a group of nonprofit and faith-based leaders, about 50 individuals in the community, uh, with another group. Uh, Mayor Snyder, a couple weeks ago, attended the Committee for Community Engagement uh, and really had, a, I think, a productive, detailed discussion with them about the proposal. And then also we had, in the meantime, in this three-week period or so, we've had three virtual outreach events. Um, one fire, virtual fireside chat with the mayor, uh, a council event, and then also a chat with the chief. And then lastly, uh, we did contact leaders of the TTSD Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement uh, to seek their input and to get them to solicit that to their, net, their network. And then finally, uh, the recent uh, formation of the Racial Unity Book Club, which has been started by our library. We saw that input from participants in those uh, of that book club. So I'd like to say to, to all the feedback we've received, staff has followed up with everybody has, who has submitted input to let them know uh, that the city council would be discussing, discussing uh, the commission and the next steps tonight. So uh, what did we hear? What did we find out? Uh, I'll turn it over to Nicole to summarize the community input that we heard about the proposal. Thanks, Kent. Hi, Mayor and Council. It's good to see you. My name is Nicole Hendricks. I'm the Senior Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. Um, as Kent mentioned, I'm here to share what we've heard from our community so far about the proposal, and I'm actually going to share my screen to show the infographic. Um, that was a guide. Let's see if I can share it. And hopefully you can see that. So, and let me know if you can't. Um, so we heard from a total of 132 people from mid-July to August 6th. And out of that group of people, 81% of the respondents um, strongly support a transformation commission. Um, the, the remaining 19% did not support the commission primarily based on, on their personal beliefs uh, around racism. And so overall, though, a lot of people agreed with the idea of a transformation commission. Um, out of those people, we also had a, a handful of folks who offered um, to serve as a member of the commission. So when when, you know that opportunity comes to have people apply we have this uh, list of folks who are interested um, in serving additionally we provided you with a list of all the individual responses that we received so all 132 of them um, and so that is available for you all to review um, the majority of our community members provided feedback through our city websites web form um, and we also received uh, comments via email, social media, and that little Teams splice is actually from the Committee for Community Engagement meeting where they um, um, showed preference for the option one or option two for a, how to appoint um, members of the commission. So all of those are being collected in our one citywide communication database, so they're together and that we were able to, to, to put this together. Um, so getting down kind of to the specifics of what we heard, I organized the feedback into three different categories to help frame the feedback. So we heard a lot about the topic areas that were presented in the proposal, the membership and structure of the commission, and then um, a lot of folks actually talked a lot about specific language in the proposal. So I'll walk through that as well. So diving into the topic areas, Overall, there was really strong support for the topic areas. There were a lot of people who were like, it looks great, um, really support this, um, and, and thanked us for, for diving into these areas. But there were um, two, two things that came up 
um, consistently. And the first one was that more than a dozen people asked why this proposal didn't incorporate more city services. Um, and I, I, to highlight that, I want to share um, a quote from, from a community member. So um, they said, the focus seems to be mostly on po uh, policing and legal issues. For transformation, we need to also focus on available for affordable, stable housing, especially for families with children, safe locations for homeless people and families to live with sanitation and clean water, equal opportunity in schools at all ages for all students, particularly this time in this time of distance learning, and a plan so that no one in our community has to survive on um, less than minimum wage. It, and they end with, if we can broaden the focus, we would have a truly transformed community in addition to a transformed police force. So that was one of, of more than a dozen comments that spoke to, to that specific um, suggestion to, to go beyond um, a specific police focus. Nicole, uh, can, you, sure. can you and Kent maybe respond to, uh, like to me, those comments are all directly related to what the communications team ended up deciding to call this. So I guess I'd like to know why, as you're bringing that comment up, you know, why did why did it get shortened to Transformation Commission and not Public Safety Transformation Commission? And this is not intended to be the only the only thing that we tackle in a similar format. So I guess I'm just it seems like we caused potentially confusion in implying that this was all the city was going to do by naming it the Transformation Commission. Is there a staff rationale or reason for that? Well, I can say, yeah, sure, yeah, and and in in receiving that question in a couple of different areas, that's exactly what we explained to him was that yes, this wasn't the sole answer to all of the issues that we're facing. That this is just one step, and that the city council and we'll be developing. Uh, either transformation commissions or other steps to look at all city services and that we know it's a really a holistic view is needed uh, at the city to make sure that we're eliminating any any sort of um, racist policies that we have in place but why did we sh what actually it's not why did we the council called it the public safety transformation commission so that kind of just didn't answer my question about why it was shortened to that because i think that just led to confusion so I'm trying to understand and I think it's important this is going to be one of the topics that we talk about um, is is there a reason why public safety was taken out of the title of it mr. mayor this is Councilor Newton and I may be remembering incorrectly but I seem to remember the first time we talked about it that the council talked about down the road we would want to be looking at other services and so I'm my memory was that it was sort of maybe not our suggestion is too strong a word but that that kind of came from the council i may be remembering it wrong maybe somebody else can help me out but i seem to remember our first conversation we talked about how this was the first step so if i'm remembering incorrectly please correct me but that's my memory yeah no it is it is the first step councillor newton i think that's accurate what what is not clear to me though is when we're seeking input on uh public safety focused uh set of information why we would take those key words out of the title and i we can move on i just don't under i mean sometimes as mayor i'm frustrated because i feel like we make we make this harder than it needs to be by doing things like this so I'll let you continue, uh, quick, Hendrick, a, sorry about that. A quick thought, Mayor. The only, only thing I could see is that when we discussed with the council, we discussed the more safety aspect of it, but then we also had a, a briefing on what staff had brought back to us. And if you blended those two together, then you kind of got a transformation commission. But I thought of them as two different parts where we'd start with the safety part and then go into the kind of what the staff came up with. So maybe, maybe this happened where the two got blended no, because we didn't ask for input on that. I mean, this is, anyway, I, I would suggest we move on. I think I've made my point. I don't, I still don't understand it, but uh, Nicole, please continue. Okay, um, that sounds good. So the second, um, the second, second topic about the topic areas um, was the 
Um, people asked for more focus on the police budget, um, accountability, and transparency. And I think what we can do um, now with, with those responses, um, specifically with the transparency one, is let people know that we do have a, a PD transparency page now, which is exciting. Um, so we'll be able to share that. But there were uh, probably 10 or so comments that asked, like, why aren't we covering like more of the police budget? So that was was something that was brought up. Okay, I'm gonna shift over to the membership and structure. So overwhelmingly, people asked for more um, black, indigenous, and people of color representation, and they specifically asked for like business representation, uh, potentially um, more broader scale representation with the county and um, schools so that we can and coordinate those efforts. Um, so that was a bit big ask from folks. Um, a second point was that people want to stay involved in the commission, um, even if they're not serving as a member, they want opportunity to stay involved as the commission goes through their work. Um, and so people asked if, if meetings would be public um, and yeah, if they would have opportunities to give feedback along the way. And then lastly, uh, we asked folks um, about if they preferred uh, an appointment method that was a community select, a council select, um, or a fusion of both. And a majority of the people asked that the community be very involved in selecting the appointment of the of the commission members. Um, so that was at 61% of the of the respondents said that they preferred the community um, to to select. And then lastly, there was um, specific requests about the language in the proposal. A lot of people felt like um, the words equity, lived experience, implicit bias, and racism were, were too vague, and they wanted to see how that specifically looks for the city of Tigard. Um, and so they asked for people to, to define that. Um, and then the second thing was we had probably five people ask that a specific sentence or two sentences in the proposal be removed because they didn't believe it was true. And that sentence was, um, quote, overall the Tiger community has been served has been well served and protected by the members of the Tiger Police Department for decades. There have not been any incidents in Tiger that look and feel like those documented in the national media. Um, and I'll just uh, quote someone who provided a response. They said, I think communities of color for decades do not feel the same way that white communities feel in regards to the police serving and protecting them. I think this statement negates the pain and trauma police have had and continue to have on communities of color. And then they said it also seems a bit tone, tone deaf. So that was an, an ask from um, a handful of folks was to remove that statement. Um, and with that summary of input, um, I guess my question to you would be if you know, we would like to see um, changes to this proposal to incorporate some of these ideas. And if so, you know, would you like that to be a follow-up action item after this meeting, or would you like to talk about talk through those now? Um, that's and if you have any questions for me, um, I can answer those. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, let's go with questions first, Council, and um, then I have a suggested way to work through this um, to try to keep it organized. So questions before or for Nicole or Kent or for city manager and I or assistant oh. city manager in Island. And I'll also add that I think Kent was also going to talk about a little bit about timeline and next steps. So if you have questions oh. specifically about the data portion, sorry, <laughs> um, then feel free to ask. Kent, why don't you finish your your uh, components? Sure thing. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so obviously there has been a lot of interest, a lot of interest in the Transformation, Transformation Commission and as staff, um, while seeking an input, we also have been taking care of or trying to be proactive and thinking about next steps and how we can uh, advance the Transformation Commission um, after this discussion tonight. So a couple things I want to highlight that we've done and then um, highlight at the end the points that uh, for discussion tonight. So. One, uh, the police department has started to outline a community police academy for commission uh, members. Uh, at the very least, this would include use of force discussions, use of force simulators, demonstration, uh, demonstrations, and other hot uh, topics. Uh, 
Uh, we have reached out to facilitator, facilitators to assist with the Transformation Commission. Uh, as you might imagine, facil facilitators, especially on this topic area, are, are very busy right now. Uh, what we've heard is uh, the, the earliest we could have somebody on board would be the beginning of 2021. And as you heard at your July 28th uh, meeting about uh, presentation and discussion about staff priorities, uh, staff continues to work on council goals along with the work created by COVID and focusing on our community for all. So we have developed a proposal for adding uh, staff to help manage the commission um, in looking at prior experiences with the levy, levy and bond task force. Um, we're looking at uh, basically three hours of prep for meeting, three hours afterwards, and, and a lot of other items that happen in between. So with that said, uh, that's what we've been trying to get ahead of um, some of the next steps, uh, or at least be able to provide you with information um, for those next steps and, and what your decisions are tonight. So with that said, we're looking for direction on advancing the Transformation Commission. A few things uh, that I've identified for discussion for council, selection of commission members. Um, there was a discussion, uh, I think in some earlier discussions about a caucus-like approach to selecting community members. So the selection, the timeline, um, some items uh, are gonna be long, take longer than others in the short term. Uh, obviously selecting commission members could be done. The education component uh, in, with the police department is something that we could do while securing facilitators and staff and subject experts may take a little bit longer. So wanna make sure that uh, we get direction from council with the timeline that you have in mind and next steps um, for us in how we can help advance the Transformation Commission. So with that said, I'll turn it back to um, mayor and council. Thank you. All right, so let's focus on questions at this point, um, and then we'll move into more general topics. Councilor Newton, any questions? Councilor Lube, any questions? None. Youth Councilor Calderon, questions? Uh, yeah, just real quick. You said that we probably could not get a facilitator before until the start of 2021. This is, like, do you envision this Transformation Commission coming together before 2021 starts and like before we'd be able to have that facilitator just because I don't know how timelines works on creating commissions or anything like this? Well, that so Youth Councilor Calderon, that's one of the things uh, Kent was seeking input on. Uh, he hasn't heard what we think yet, but I, I. I, uh, what I heard him just say was that uh, some of the prep work, including selecting commission members and potentially uh, getting them through some of the training that we had planned might be possible before the end of 2021, uh, 2020 with the intention that maybe the commission could start work with a facilitator uh, and appropriate staff starting in early 2021. That's what I heard him say. None of us have commented on that yet, but Kent, is that accurate? That's uh, very accurate, Mr. Mayor. All right. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Councilor Anderson, any questions? Well, you know, the staff recommended that we, we tweak this language. Do you guys have any specifics for tonight? Well, I, Councilor Anderson, that's, oh, you mean, are you asking the staff if they have yes. specific recommendations? I mean, I've got a list of like 30 or 40 points that we have to go through and make agreement on, and that's certainly one of them. Okay. Well, then we'll just, I'll just leave it for that. Council President Goodhouse? No question. Comments only. Okay. Um, at the, in this, the spirit of potentially, I mean, I don't, I don't love to start with myself talking on a topic, but in the spirit of trying to keep this organized, I guess what I'm wondering is would the council be okay with, um, let me talk just briefly about what I, what I've done. I took the feedback from the CCE. I took feedback from, uh, the letter from TPOA. Uh, I guess I should not use acronyms with the, given that this is a public meeting, sorry. The um, Committee for Citizen Engagement was the first group. Uh, the Tiger Police Officers Association provided input. And then I have a huge list from the community. I actually read every single one of the 38 pages of feedback 
um, and sort of pulled out uh, all the things that seem like they needed to be addressed or should be addressed. So I now have that list on it's two pages long. And what I'm going to propose is that I, I bring them up and we try to address each one of them. And I'm hoping staff can be tracking what the decisions are around these. But council, are you willing to try it that way? And then if there's discussion points that you want to make that you did that didn't come up on the list then we can catch those at the end is that reasonable okay i see a lot of heads saying yes and fingers okay so the cce the things that came out of that for me were one I, and i'd heard this before but they kind of drove it home was um whether or not we should given the amount of time and the fact that time is a barrier for particularly for certain community members, whether we should be offering compensation for community members to participate. So that's uh, that's one, that's issue number one. I just, uh, that wasn't necessarily the most important, but it's on, it's on my list in the order that I heard all these things. So uh, anybody have thoughts on that? I mean, we are expecting a lot of commitment here. So anyone? Would speak make for the, the oh, sorry. Go ahead, you Councilor Calderon. Yeah, so would that be just for the six residents, or um, who are you referring to with that? Well, that certainly is the initial question, but it could be broader than that. I mean, certainly members of staff that are there are going to already be getting paid. They're already being paid for participating. They wouldn't get it. I don't think they would get extra participation or extra money for participating. Council, Council President Goodhouse, were you trying to speak? Yeah, I was going to say I would be in um, favor if, if we want to look at compensation for daycare service or transportation or some of those, but I think if we were to pay for time, it might be viewed as um, a paid opinion maybe. That's just my thoughts, but I would like to see um, to remove barriers from being on it that would be transportation, daycare, things like that to make it accessible where someone may not be able to do it due to kids or or um, transportation or any of those those uh, those um, areas. I would even add meals into that too, because if you're the primary person responsible for for preparing a meal when the meeting's supposed to be happening, that may be a barrier for your family too. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? So so maybe an alternative to compensation that might get at the same thing. Um, other yeah. other thoughts on this point, Council. No. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it would be good for for to remove barriers like that, and I agree with you, Mr. Mayor. I think meals are important, but I would not want to put someone in the position where it was essentially costing them to participate. So anything we can do to get folks uh, barriers removed, I think, is important. So I agree with that. Okay, Councilor Lou, Councilor Anderson, do you guys have specific comments or do you want to just support what's being proposed here, which is that we basically pay for things that are barriers, daycare, transportation, meals, and perhaps anything else that comes up that we didn't think about? Yes, but I not agree. Pay, not pay people for the actual hours. Okay, we have a plan there. One item, way to go, Council. Um, Majority of people seem to favor option two. That was one of the issues that uh, staff uh, commented on, option two being the caucus style of selection. Um, I will point out that a lot of people who are, um, I would say more of our traditional commenters, the people that we hear from a lot more, all seem to favor option one, which I think was a reflective of the fact that they trust us and they also saw um, like for the more maybe politically savvy, they were a little concerned about what option two, the possible unintended results that option two could bring. So I'll just add that into the flavor of the discussion. Councilor Lube. Um, I, you know, I read the 38 pages as well, and I actually appreciated a couple of the suggestions of maybe a hybrid of both. Yep. Um, where, you know, maybe the community chooses the, the top 12 and then, you know, the council could choose the six. Um, I just worry about those unintended consequences of maybe a majority of the commission representing one area and not representing the broad area that we're trying to um, aim for. So I was wondering what the other counselors had as far as maybe a hybrid of, 
of the two options. Yeah, so the community selects maybe 12, and then we, we narrow it down to six. Okay, um, that's a proposal on the table. What do people, people like that? Yeah. I think that's a good approach that we, we let the community select the, the folks that we take a look at. So yeah, I agree. I think that's a good approach. Okay, so uh, that, that'll be direct number two will be that the, the, uh, we'll go with the caucus to get down to 12 and then the council will make final appointments from there. Um, okay, there was a, the other thing that came from the CCE was they suggested that we add a topic about officers uh, potentially living within our communities like as either a requirement or a certain number of them. I don't know if we want to add that. That's kind of a minor point given that we've given that we've um, given the authority to the ca the commission to choose their own topics. It maybe doesn't totally matter if we add it or don't, but I wanted to at least bring that from given that it came from the CCE, which is like the one of the main groups we asked to give us input on things. Thoughts there? Councillor Newton, I also attended that CCE meeting. I think it's one of those topics that folks are kind of interested in how that works or how that doesn't work. And, you know, I think there are reasons that police officers do or don't live in a community. So, you know, I mean, I think it's something that, you know, might be worthy of an explanation or a s small discussion on, but I don't know that it's a major topic. I, I do th think that people wonder about it. Yeah, why don't we punt that to the uh, chief to consider not publishing, obviously, individual information, but maybe publishing uh, on the transparency page the number of officers that live in Tigard, the numbers that live in cities right around Tigard, like some some sort of information to give people the perspective on, um, you know, where where our officers, like how much a member of our community that. Uh, folks feel they are. Would that be a reasonable thing to do with that one? Yeah, and also explain why people make the choice to live in the community, because there are reasons officers, oh, here comes the chief, I see her coming on. <laughs> there are reasons, I think, that folks uh, do choose. Yeah, we, we have the data, and my only hesitation is just timing. Um, if you've paid attention, there is a lot of effort to identify officers' homes, to uh, mark them up, to ask people to uh, be a short officer in their home. So the timing might not be the best, and I can imagine uh, the association uh, bringing those concerns. It's, it's something down the road. As things calm down, I would love to uh, discuss it some more. But I, I'm, I am concerned about uh, the timing right now and the volatile um, things that we're seeing out, not necessarily in Tigard, but um, yeah. out in the Northwest. And maybe maybe we can come up with a compromise, like at least putting the the county that they live in, like just the the count of the number of people that live in Washington County, Multnomah County, Yamhill County, et cetera. That would probably be de-identified so, enough. I don't know, Chief, if maybe there's some, some happy medium there that can um, provide people information. Yeah, we'll take a look at that, absolutely. Or mayor, or even okay. maybe just saying percentage that live in Tiger and percentage that live outside of Tiger, so that doesn't specify where. That would even be maybe simpler. But I, I agree with Councillor Newton that maybe a explanation of why and examples of maybe why officers choose not to live in the same community. Um, I know we, I think a lot of us have heard the reasons why, so it'd be good um, to do that. And I, when I did the leadership Tiger, that was actually a question that uh, a lot of the um, members of that leadership group were asking the officers when we had that day when we talked to officers why they don't live in their community. Okay, um, thank you Chief for that. Uh, feedback from TPOA, uh, they suggested that the title of the group be changed to Public Safety Advisory Committee. What do people think about that? It, I mean, I think it makes uh, the charge of the group a little weaker, so I, I will make that comment um, with that change in language. I think words matter, but uh, they, they had a lot of feedback about the fact that the, that the word transformation uh, implies dramatic change, which they don't think is necess necessarily 
necessary and uh, commission implies that the group has the authority to make decisions independently, which they, you know, have already provided feedback on. So I don't know what the what the uh, council's thoughts are on this, but anybody have strong feelings or reason to make a change? We could add the word advisory, but I don't know. It's already changed, as you pointed out, so I don't know if we need to change it again. And if we keep changing it after we do surveys, and people wonder what it is after, if you keep changing the title. Well, it's more to me, it's more than that. Like, the way we've structured it, it's not just advisory. It's, it, it's giving the chief and the city manager direction, um, you know, once the commission reaches consensus to implement something unless there's some you know, compelling reason why it can't be, like it's illegal or something. Yeah, I think the word advisory doesn't really reflect the, what we're asking the group to do. So um, I, I just don't, I just don't think it reflects the charge. So not the right word. Yeah, I just don't think it reflects it. Councillor Anderson, Council Lube, anything on this one, or Youth Councillor Calderon? Um, I it, to go back to the topic you were talking about earlier. I would agree with um, changing the name to the Public Safety Transformation Commission because I agree that you know we may use additional transformation commissions going forward. But I think it's important to acknowledge that the makeup of the commission members may be very different depending upon the topic that we're trying to assess. And so I think using the term transformation commission is probably too broad um, for what we're trying to do. Um, but I would agree with the other comments that advisory isn't correct, especially given um, the charge that we're giving this group of individuals. Um, but I would support adding the public safety um, to the front of it. In, in my mind, it's still called the Public Safety Transformation Commission. I, to me, this was just a communication failure and from my perspective. Um, but well, Councillor Lube, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> well, Matt, we can talk about adding it to paper and, and making it not just in your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't hear support for that one, so we'll move on. Um, they pointed out, and I think this is a good point out, uh, frankly, the Tiger Police Officers Association had a lot of, I think, really valuable feedback for us. So one of the things they pointed out is that we don't describe the leadership structure for the commission at all. And I don't know that we need to uh, I think you probably all would agree that we should probably do that. Um, if you object to that, please say so now. Um, otherwise, I uh, I think staff and I, if need be, can work on just describing a little paragraph about the leadership structure for the commission. Is everybody okay with that? Anybody yeah. object to it, I should say. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they, they wanted to add some language about uh, how their participation was not in lieu of bargaining. I think that's fine um, to add. You know, we can't, even if we wanted to not say that, it wouldn't be true. So I think it's reasonable to add that language. Anybody object to that? Okay. Um, they had comments about youth participation and were concerned about having two members of uh, two, they called underage youth participating on the commission given the serious nature of it um i this is probably the point i disagree most with them about um two out of 15 is not even representative in the percentage of population that is between zero and 18 years old for one uh second there and that perhaps they would be surprised to learn this but there are there are cities in the united states that have youth members that are voting members of their city councils um, we don't have that yet because it would require a charter uh, change, but um, does anyone feel like this needs to be changed? We had two, I think we called out the president of the Black Student Union from Tigard High School and then our youth advisory, uh, pardon me, our youth city councilor as participating. Does um, And youth councilor Calderon, you want to, I don't want to put you on the spot if you feel uncomfortable speaking, but Perhaps you, you want to say something. Uh, no, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I would like to say that age does not dictate maturity or knowledge on these topics. Like, I know that 
I've been talking with the black, the current Black Student Union um, president, and he's very knowledgeable about these topics. And I would trust him to make very great decisions about this. And I mean, like you said, two out of fifteen isn't representative. And I know that uh, it's very important to hear youth voices, especially since this is something that will play out larger in our portion of life. Like we will grow up with these changes. So I think that it's very important to have youth members on this commission. Council, anyone uh, anyone feel differently and want to entertain the the um, TPOA perspective? Council President Goodhouse, I don't I don't have a problem with the youth. I just the one thing that I, one of the comments I think was making a point was that um, if you're looking at someone to represent the student unions and if you're looking at just from the uh, the Black Student Union, what about the other um, groups and so forth? So that was the only thing I remember one of the comments being in there. So I don't know if we want to differentiate well, that or yeah that. I mean that was one comment youth counselor called the is there to represent everybody and frankly in this moment I think it'd be to me that would be tone deaf to ignore uh, the um, the the group that clearly in many ways is the brunt of the most racism in our country I just think is a big miss, but that's my personal opinion, so I'll let other counselors weigh in if they think I'm off base there. I was, just more, I was just more thought, I was just more of a thought on how to kind of address the broader range. I wasn't re referencing take that, that aspect out. Okay. I was just, well, so do you have a proposal then that's an alternative? Um, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, Councilor Calderon is going to represent the, the school as well. Um, I don't know if the school would want to select someone or how you, or maybe a way that those, all those different groups kind of work together and communicate with, with the, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to really approach We've that. already got a group that's at the maximum size it can be. So if we're adding people, we need to be taking other people away. Councilor yeah. Newton, go ahead. Yeah, Ms. Mr. Mayor, I just want to say that um, kudos to, to uh, Councilor Calderon because he is being um, brings it up pretty much at every Youth Advisory Council meeting. He's uh, made himself very approachable to the youth in the community and not just on this but on pretty much anything they want to talk to him about. So I think, you know, I'm commending, I want to commend him because he's making a real effort to um, make himself available to the youth of the community and I think he takes it seriously. And so I think um, I I think that he'll do a good job representing the the broader youth in the community, provided they let him know what they're thinking. So anyway, I just wanted to weigh in on that. I think you know since we are limited in the number, I think two will be fine. <clears throat> I would just point out um, that I I agree with the two that we have on there and the representation, but um, it the list also does um, allow for the um, president of the Tiger. High school black student union or a designee so it doesn't specifically say that it has to be that person but there is that option for them to choose a designee as well and that's already in there all right uh, any further discussion on that or can we move on uh, the next comment from TPOA was to add language that some topic like at the beginning of the topic section that some topic topics Oh, I can't speak. Some topics would require bargaining. Again, this is just a factual comment, so I think it's fine to add it. Anyone object to that? All right. Um, they also added, uh, and Chief, maybe you can comment on this. Uh, I assume you'd have a feedback on this, actually, for the next couple topics, so you might as well get ready. Um, they were suggesting in the training section of topics that are tech be added to uh, to the hours of training discussion. Do you um, do you have a comment on that, Chief? Do you want that in there or not in there, or do you care? On the number on the on the hours required a well, specific number. I just kind of cut out. Sorry. Um, they gave. Let me let me pull up their feedback specifically. Um, they wanted to add a reference to, to RTEP in the section around hours of training in the basic police academy in Oregon. 
they said recruit training evaluation program that is done at Tiger Police Department after graduation from Basic Police Academy and before being released to work as a solo officer. They want they want the topic to be sort of added to, and they want that those words in there. Do you have feedback about that or thoughts? Do you have an objection or a concern? No, I, I think it, it's just uh, informational, and and we we already recognize that we're going to have a lot of information, and and dialogue about different topics but just in that section if it gets published as is we're just letting people know that there is um, additional requirements after the academy um, that lets anybody else who sees this document be aware of that all right so council are you okay with having that added as requested just for clarification that's in the topic areas to add that well, it was added to a topic area that already existed. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Okay. It's just sort of adding more color commentary, I would say, to that topic. Um, they had a lot to say and concern about the, uh, and they actually made a comment, uh, which I thought was a good one, about um, the bias in the psych evaluation uh, and whether or not uh, and Chief, you need you're going to need to weigh in here too. Um, and and again, this was a very I think on point comment from them because we've talked about how everybody has bias, and so their question was like, Mayor, you've already said everybody has bias, which is true. So then, if we're going to reject everybody that has any bias in the psych evaluation, that clearly isn't workable. So um, I can accept that we got to do something here. Uh, in the way this is written. Uh, Chief, do you have comments about how, you know, I, I I actually, I mean, I've been, obviously I went through one of these psych evaluations a long time ago, but um, are we confident, actually I want to ask a, even a broader question, Chief, are we confident that this psych uh, evaluation that's being done, psychiatric evaluation that's being done um, is not representing some sort of systemic bias or racism just in and itself? You know, it's a it's a question I've posed. So uh, at the end of June, our longtime psychologist retired. And so I had to actively go out and um, find another psychologist who was uh, an expert in uh, for police professions. And, and she's widely known in the state of Oregon. She's a subject matter expert, and we have Dr. Harding now. Uh, but those were questions in the interviews that I asked her. You know, do your measurements, uh, have they basically progress? Do they, you know, make sure that there's not hidden biases with different groups and all of that? So I've asked the questions. Obviously, um, I'm reliant on her expertise to t tell me that they, they don't have those. Um, but I, I did ask those. I think it would behoove, and I think it's very interesting that um, maybe we even get Dr. Harding or what, somebody in her office at some point to talk about when you're on board and what you're looking for and the types of uh, tests, because there's there's many um, that uh, go through. Because I, I've I've had some people that I just thought were absolutely wonderful and not pass the psychological. So. Um, it's a good check and balance, but it's it's one that I think is is worthy of educating our um, commission on how that, that selection works, and they can ask their questions. So what's what's interesting is I'm reading. Thank you, Chief, for that feedback. I'm kind of reading the the feedback, um, and and also remembering why this is written the way it is. You know, the transformation commission topics were from the community like we didn't make this stuff up so you know the the question that was coming from the community is should we be excluding candidates that demonstrate any sort of bias um and i understand i mean that did factually come from the community maybe we need to adjust it to the point that the that the uh, police officers association's making which is that everybody has bias so this is impossible to impossible to do um, Chief, would you mind uh, taking this one and maybe working with the city manager and or assistant city manager to see if, if uh, you guys can come up with an alternative that still gets at what the community 
is asking here, but also sort of addresses the um, very appropriate issue that TPOA has raised. Um, Council, are you okay with that? Uh, I'd be happy to, and I, I believe we're gonna be focusing on uh, racial biases, so, or, or any biases of, of particular groups, which we do test and try to. So if somebody has hate speech out on their, their social media site, there's some uh, uh, testing things that will identify those triggers. So yeah, I think it's gonna be, we can narrow those biases that we don't want um, kind of a hate type biases. So we'll work on the language. Yeah, I mean, I just want you to reformat the, where what I'm asking is to reformat the trans Transformation Commission language to get at what we what should probably be being asked there, and, I will and do that. address and address my internal inconsistency that I acknowledge. Okay, uh, their next their next comment was about the workforce, uh, where we we um, I think that the question and comment was around whether our workforce represents our our community as a whole. Um, their comment was that it, it does already, though I think from the chief, um, chief, you might need to come back here. I think we actually have one whole, and it might be with the Latinx community, if I'm remembering correctly. We have one gap kind of to being reflective of the community. We're about a percentage short, and, uh, I, you know, I think the greater the intent is, is just, again, looking for diversity, reflecting the community, not necessarily uh, percentage to percentage, but diversifying yeah. our department. Yeah. I thought it, I, I must be misremembering, because I thought when we talked about this a couple months ago at one of my um, listening sessions, there was a bigger gap there. I don't remember it being 1% or I wouldn't have brought it up. Um, but what, do, what does the council want to do with this one? So the specific... Let me go back to the specific feedback so the council knows what they're reacting to here. Um, uh, police, the, the topic for the Transformation Commission was police workforce that reflects the community. Um, and the TPOA comment was, uh, it, don't the stats in fact show the police department is, is the most reflective of all the departments within the city? Wouldn't this be better stated as saying so that this is their proposal, to maintain a police workforce that is reflective of the Tigard community. So that's the ask. Councilor Lube, I'm going to pick on you. What do you what's your, uh, we'll go around to everybody, but what's your thought on this? I think adding the word maintain is fine, um, just because we do have diversity in there to begin with. And so um, I think it provides as a great discussion and education topic for our community on, on what um, the diversity of the police force currently is. So that would that would add the word maintain in front of it. So it would be maintain police workforce that reflects the community. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think that's a. I I like that proposal. Uh, can the rest of the council live with that? Thumbs up. Okay. Perfect. I we're getting to voting with thumbs. That's perfect. Um, and it's recorded, so people can people can see it. Uh, let's see, last thing from TPOA. Uh, they were asking for clarification around the language with extremists and racist groups. So that was a monitoring to ensure no officers are members of extremists or racist groups, and this is a condition of employment. Um, their main comment around here was that who determines what's an extremist or racist group? Arguments could be made that almost any group could be considered an extremist or racist group. This needs more specifics as to how or what is considered one of these groups. Uh, can we punt this to the chief as well? Chief McAlpine, can you take this one and work on it? Uh, I'd be happy to do so. Okay, council, you okay with that? Thumbs? Okay. Oh, two thumbs from Councilor Newton, okay. Uh, okay, now we get to the community. So here's the, here's the uh, I think the, most important input from the community overall. Um, one was about the training required and that people of color uh, and actually uh, the whole BIPOC community may be hesitant to participate in the training that we're asking them to do. And we're wondering about whether there's a virtual, potentially a virtual way or um, some other way, especially in the 
sort of COVID-19 time period? How would we do ride-alongs? And just are we, by requiring um, the community members to participate in this, are we creating a barrier that is a problem? So this is a big, important issue from my perspective. So uh, let's start with Councillor Newton, and then we'll go around each person to speak on this one. Well, uh, I saw that concern when I was reading through, and and I, you know, that is a concern. Um, how how we're going to approach that if people feel, you know, uncomfortable or that's a barrier. Unfortunately, I I don't really have a response at how at how we do address it, but I do think it's something that we need to be able to figure out so that um, people don't. I mean, I th I think ride-alongs are. I found value in ri doing a ride-along. But um, I, you know, if it's going to be a barrier, I, I, again, I'm a little bit, I don't really have another suggestion, but I do think it's something we need to think about. I mean, for purposes of being thought provoking here, uh, I think there was one or two, I don't remember if they were in writing or if they came in a different format, but one or two members of the, of the community made comments like, well, if we're required to do all this training to participate, why don't the officers that are participating have to go uh, basically live as a BIPOC member of the community for a week, which I thought was interesting. I don't know how to make that happen exactly, but like that's the perspective that's being shared. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that. Councillor Anderson, thoughts on this topic? Well, if this doesn't start until July or January, you know, COVID could be a non-issue. It could be very much in play. Um, yeah, I think that there's some sort of training that has to be done because, uh, you know, we, we've got to start from some place of uh, some consistency. So, uh, you know, I don't know how that's going to happen, but uh, I think some training needs to happen. Okay. Uh, Council President Goodhouse? What I would say would be... Um, with those that maybe show or maybe there's a, an option for people that may have some um, be uncomfortable with it uh, give the option if there's a preference to a male or female or a person of color that they ride with or maybe if there is really some uncomfortability maybe if they ride with the chief or maybe it's something where it's uh, um, maybe a scale down where maybe if it's the the uniform or something maybe take some considerations but I do I do think it's a very important part of the the process to to see it from that those that eyes and go through the process, so I don't think that should be removed. But I think there should be definitely accommodations put in place to see what maybe a person may be uncomfortable with and, and make adjustments. Chief, is that something we could accommodate if we want? Could we offer that somebody could ride with an officer that was a person of color if they wanted to? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that suggestion, Council President Goodhouse. Councilor Lube? Yeah, so I agree. You know, I've gone on a couple of ride-alongs and um, I've found them extremely helpful just to understand um, the kind of calls that the officers are taking and it's an opportunity to really have some in-depth conversations. But I also acknowledge that my experience um, is not one that everybody is going to have or, or a comfort level. And so I think being able to provide some alternatives is a good idea. I also see the side, um, you know, in those comments where they were asking for sort of the other side of the training, um, which I acknowledge and I think we should probably address as well. Um, Mr. Mayor, you were talking about earlier today, um, you know, two videos and a book um, regarding some of these issues. Maybe that is standard education to under for the entire committee to start yeah. on a fundamental understanding of the other side of it as well. So they're, okay. they're coming like in that. with um, a baseline for, you know, all sides of this issue. So I definitely um, wanted to speak to that as well and acknowledge that if we're asking them to understand the police side, then there needs to be some work to understand the other side as well. Excellent suggestion. Uh, staff, can you get that added too? I think that I don't think anyone's going to object to that. So that would be adding the two one hour videos and the book. Um, Assistant City Manager Nyland's got that information. I think it'd actually Which, be good for the whole group to go through that, not just the police officers. 
And I would say that in light of we were talking about barriers, that the book is something that we should be providing um, at our co at the cost of the city yeah. to these individuals. Absolutely. And, and I, I had actually toyed with buying enough of them to send to all the people that were saying there's no racism in Taggart, but we, we had decided on the it's library. A long list. <laughs> well, House President Goodhouse. Well, and, and I'd take that a step further, rather than maybe being presumptive and, and picking which videos in the book should be, maybe we also maybe should take um, and look at maybe committee members or people of color, maybe if there's uh, videos they find more relevant or a book that's more relevant, maybe that should be decided on, rather than us kind of, you know, automatically pr presuming which book and videos are best. That That's a, a fine piece of feedback. I know that the book we're recommending is one that's been picked by that community so um but the videos are um i guess one can question uh so that's fine i mean that's good feedback council president goodhouse i like that um staff i really hope you're taking detailed notes can someone confirm on the staff that all this is I'm getting recorded notes. i guess you guys are recording the meeting yeah. too so there are many notes being taken <laughs> okay. i've already gone through this is my second pen Wow, that's a lot of writing. Okay. Um, okay, I think we've addressed that. Uh, and Council President Goodhouse and Councilor Lube, I want to really thank you for um, your contributions there. Those are excellent suggestions and things that uh, will solve problems, I think, in a very creative way. Uh, another comment, and, and Nicole co uh, added or commented on this, was to add the police budget accountability and transparency. Um, as a topic area, so I think we should add that. I don't. I mean, we had a lot of community input about it. Uh, can everybody give their thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh, and I'm realizing Youth Councilor Calderon. I did not. I did not mean to. Okay, I have to get your. I have literally something on my screen that's covering you up. So let me try to get that off because I. That's literally why I missed calling on you on the last thing. So. Youth Councilor Calderon, this is really important to me. Did you have comments about the the people of color being hesitant to participate and then the suggestions that we all just made about how to, um, and I can't get the window off of your face. This is driving me nuts. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Council, or Youth Councilor Calderon. Uh, yeah, so I would totally agree with the fact that some members might be hesitant to go on a ride along. I know that... Uh, ride along I would do it but that is not something I would be particularly excited for or looking forward to I was going to suggest that maybe you could have an additional person with you on a ride along but given the fact that there's only the two front seats and then someone would have to sit in the back I don't know how someone would feel about sitting in the back because that seems like not the most fun place to be and could be uh, a little bit traumatizing for some people but otherwise I think that there's not really an alternative to a ride along and I would get that there would be some very insightful things that you would learn about the life of a policeman um, from the ride along so I think that as much as people might not like it I cannot think of a different alternative to going in person on a ride along what did you think about the allowing them to ride with a person of color yeah. if they prefer that uh, yes oh yeah you totally reminded me um I was going to say that they should be able to meet with officers before in order to create a relationship before going into the ride along because I think that would significantly lessen the stress of going on it. So I think uh, even if the ride along is later along in the training and you have the officers that the members would be riding along with uh, at the training so then they can introduce themselves and get familiar with each other that would be very good and I'm very sorry I said ride along about 40 billion times uh, chief can we make that happen as well or anyone that requests it yeah I, I think w within reason you know obviously you have uh, if there are constraints to the hours that they can ride along and and the person that they're interested in riding with doesn't work that shift but those are just logistics I think we get to what we're trying to accomplish and the point and I think we can we can work with with anybody on um, how to make this happen all right um, so back to the police budget accountability and transparency is everybody supportive of adding that thumbs okay 
Yeah, youth Councilor Calderon, you can you can vote right now. Like this is cool with your thumb. Okay. Um, the next one, the next feedback from the community was to remove the no incident statement. Um, and I'm going to suggest that we consider whether we should maybe change the language. I think it's important. I mean, it is it is true. It is true that there's not been a tigered police officer that's been on the national news. In, I mean, that, that just hasn't happened in a media event where we have uh, caused the death of someone and it's made national news and become, you know, that kind of a spotlight issue. And that's what that sentence is supposed to be about. But I get that it's it's definitely, you know, to some they said it, sound, that it felt tone deaf. Um, I, we definitely, I don't think, want to be in that place. Uh, and, and it also, it sounds like, is contradictory to how some people feel and have experienced life in Tigard. So I want to be sensitive to that. So who, who's got a creative suggestion on this one? What, what about listing this, the detail that, that, that just kind of summarize a little bit what you said or put a disclaimer next to it saying that there hasn't been any incident that's gotten national attention from the city of Tigard? Um, well, that's, what, that's essentially what we said. I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think we, that's much Did different. we spell it out or do we just say there hasn't been any incident? I mean, if, is there a little bit more? Do we just put a little... So I see what they're saying is that maybe there's been a there's been smaller um, incidences, but just haven't come to the national level or state level or haven't gotten made newsworthy. Councillor Lube, anything creative, or Councillor Anderson? I just take it out. I, take the whole sentence out. My vote would also be to take it out. I I feel like um, you know there are people who have felt or who have had a negative experiences and I don't I, I want to also acknowledge that without maybe measuring them against each other because I think those experiences are very important for the people who are going through them I agree take it out I, th I think um, to echo what Councillor Lube said for some people their experience is you know really traumatizing and the reason I'm not suggesting an alternative is I you know I it's not my experience and I'm I'm very mindful as we're going through this um, you know that I I'm just how much how little I know and how little I've experienced what what folks have experienced so I would support taking it out this was added just to give a little bit of context this was added based on feedback in prior versions from the Tiger Police Officers Association about just wanting to acknowledge that they've not they've not had one of these incidents that and they're I don't know if proud is the right word but they they feel um, pretty strongly that um, that they want to make sure that they're not dragged into what they view as the national narrative that's not consistent with the way they have performed. That's why this is here, but I agree that it can probably be taken out. Youth Councilor Calderon, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would just agree with taking it out. I, uh, I don't see no reason not to, and uh, I mean, not all experiences are equal like they are in the national media, but we, there's no reason to draw attention to that. Okay, so we are taking that sentence out, I'm hearing. And it's just the one sentence. So it's just the sentence that says, there have not been any incidents in Tigard that look and feel like those documented in the national media. And I've looked at the sentence before and after, and I think they follow OK. Um, OK, so anyone, uh, can everybody support that? Thumbs? OK. Um, there was a request to add definitions of equity, lived experience, implicit bias, and racism. This seems like a no-brainer. Everybody supportive of that? Okay, staff, uh, get working on those. That'll be fun. Uh, there was a comment to broaden the scope beyond public safety. 
I think that comment came directly from the title of the document and the fact that, um, and I don't know if we, I, I can't remember if staff in edits removed the section about this is, this is just the first, you know, the first area. Um, I, I guess what I, oh, the city commission will be just one part of the city's anti-racism action plan. Um, I guess staff, I would say maybe beef that up a little bit to make it super clear that this is what we're doing to address public safety as a first step, but that does not mean that's the only thing that matters, nor the only thing we're working on. Everybody good with that? I love it. Council President Goodhouse is voting before, before we even ask the question. Perfect. Um, this next one, this is a big topic, so be prepared to talk. Uh, the comment about uh, increased BIPOC representation, uh, business schools, Washington County. I want to reiterate, we already have a group that's almost too big to be functional. So if we're talking about adding people, we're talking about removing others, uh, or we're like changing numbers, decreasing them, or removing people. So um, in that context, what do we what do we want to say here uh youth counselor calderon uh yeah so i would agree that having people of color it would be an issue because it's possible that uh not even all six of the community members will be next year the youth city counselor may not be a person of color and then uh, the designee could also the designee from the bsu could also not be a person of color although i wouldn't expect that so I do see that that may be an issue in the future. I don't think that we should be adding members. Um, I know that I will be working with a bunch of other, I will try and have like my own advisory committee or just like a small group of other high schoolers to talk to about all these uh, issues before going into meetings. And I know that I will be hearing from lots of, or I will try to hear from lots of people of color. So I think that as adding members in an official matter I don't think that we can do any more than what we already have but I think that I will be here that all the members on the commission will be hearing from lots of people of color and obviously that's not the same but I think that uh, that will be our best step moving forward I mean just as a reminder to the council what is written in the in the uh, proposed draft right now says six Tigard residents from the community at large with preference to those that can best represent the BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and faith communities in Tigard. Councillor Lube? Um, I, I want to keep it to Tigard residents. I think this is something important for our community, and I, I don't want to broaden it and, and add additional members in, and I don't want to change the community makeup. Um, I think there's always a potential for, you know, years down the road, if this continues on for a long time, you know, the membership to change. Um, but I, I like the verbiage, and I like the emphasis, and I, I think we have a clear direction. Um, that that's our goal. Um, so I don't know if we can add verbiage to make it stronger, um, but I feel like the intent is there and, you know, that we certainly have our marching orders of the kind of community input that we're looking for. Councillor Anderson? Yeah, I think keep it tigered only. I mean, I know a lot of the other cities are doing their own thing. I don't want somebody that's going to be on um, multiple committees so um, just keep it the way it is I think it's it's framed nicely Council President Goodhouse I agree keep it tigered only um, the only thing I'm thinking that might be able to help this situation a little bit and I've kind of brought it before and I don't know what the the structure of the the meetings will be but if there's um maybe the uh, public comment um, portion of it could be a, a factor of that or if maybe the um, the commission has a, an email address or something where people can give comments and they all have access or that or, or email addresses or something where they can, there can be more of an outlet that they can have communication with the public. But I agree with you start getting it too big, then you can't really function well 
and um, not going outside of Tigard and anything like that. So I think maybe the only thing would be is to maybe open up some forms of communication to hear from other people. All right. Um, Councilor Newton? I agree with what's been said. I think limit it to Tigard, Tigard and um, I think we've worked pretty hard to try to um, put together a commission that is manageable in terms of numbers, but as reflective as we can be. And I think to echo something that Council President Goodhouse said, having some ability for people to connect with the commission, I think we talked a little bit about it, where people can be some sort of facilitated regular um, communication back and forth, feel comfortable weighing in on different issues. I think that will be important because the people that choose to get engaged that way will, pe will probably be people that are really interested and uh, also members of, the, of the, uh, um, the community that we're trying to get representation from. Okay, so let me let me try to make a proposal here. Um, I what I'm hearing is we're keeping it pretty much the way it is, as far as representation and the structure goes and numbers. But I also hear uh, staff, Kathy Nyland. I am hope that you uh, could take point on adding uh, some sort of a, a section about uh, public input, so that it's clear that there's an expectation that the commission have some uh, structured time when they take input from the public? Yep, we'll work on developing a mechanism for that connection. Okay, is uh, can I get thumbs on that one? Okay. Um, now jumping, now this one to me is a little different than the prior one. There was a very specific couple of comments about the um, city attorney and the municipal court judge participating, and I think the judge is viewed as sort of a neutral, you know, neutral. But one of the points was, if you're going to include the city attorney, why don't you have a public defender participating as well? Um, I'm curious to know if people are moved by that, and if so, would we increase the number by one? Would we decrease the community members to five? Um, is this a good idea, a bad idea? What do people think? I think it's, I, oh, I, President Goodhouse, go ahead. I, I think it's good. I mean, I don't want to add to it, but also knowing our judge, I don't know how, how much of the show he would take over. Um, but I think it would be good to have that perspective, especially since there's the, um, a lot of issues that have been raised around how the courts work and the court system and how that might have an effect on um, people of color. So I think it would I wonder, be... I wonder if we'd even be able to get someone to participate with the time commitment, but maybe. It may, it may just be a portion. It may not be the whole thing. It may be just a portion of it, just maybe the first part, the middle. Um... Councilor Lube? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I think the city is, attorney is there to ensure that, you know, discussion topics and everything is making sure that we're not going against any laws as far as the city and, and we're doing those sorts of things. I understand maybe the discussion of thinking that um, we need a public defender, but I would say on that um, situation, our city attorney is not a prosecutor. So the the interests um, or goals would be different. The city attorney is there to make sure that we're not going to be breaking any laws and we're going to be compliant rather than more of like a prosecutor versus a, a public defender sort of um, thing. So I would, I, I acknowledge the comment, um, but I don't agree with adding it. Councillor Newton, Councillor Anderson, or Youth Councillor Calderon, if any of you want to speak, just r wave your hand, otherwise I'm going to, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, I think you could have them as a guest speaker, but I, I don't think a, a voting member or a continual member. Okay. Um, City Attorney Rahala comment. Uh, sorry, Council. Um, I agree with the statement that uh, Councillor Luke made that my representation on the commission wouldn't be in the role of city prosecutor. Um, the judge and I are going to be neutral, factual um, contributors to this. So 
I think the decision that council has reached is uh, is fine with me. Okay. Does anyone, uh, Councillor Newton or Councillor Calderon, either of you want to speak? Wave, wave your hand. Nope. Okay. All right. So we will not add a public defender, though there may be a point at which one might be brought in as an ad hoc, uh, if the group needs them as a as a uh, subject matter expert. Um, the last comment was the about the using the reimagine Oregon topics as a blueprint. So this is the last comment I have for us tonight. Um, you all can add, but uh, do people, I have not had a chance to look at that in detail. Um, I'm wondering if any staff members, either the chief or uh, assistant city manager in Nyland, has anybody or city attorney, has anyone looked at the reimagine Oregon topics uh, and whether any of those should be added to this or anyone else looks at that? I believe this is the blueprint being put together by um, by uh, it was either by a coalition of people of color or a coalition of uh, black community leaders. I can't. I I actually don't know because it was just brought today that I saw that comment and I haven't had a chance to research it. But uh, I I see Councillor Lube's probably googling right now. Uh, no, I, I brought it up when I saw it come across, but I haven't had a chance to dive into um, the discussion okay. points. Okay. So I, I guess staff, what I would say is, why don't you take a look at the look at the topics on the Reimagine Oregon blueprint, and if there are topics that should be added that we either don't cover or aren't covered well, um, could we get those added to the the topic of the topics of discussion? Is that reasonable? City attorney and, and assistant city manager, I think you guys would be most appropriate to take that. Yes, the city attorney and I will um, review and um, loop back with you. Okay. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to suggest that given the comprehensive nature of those edits, actually, I, I, need, I missed an important process step here. Sorry, it's getting late. Does anyone have a topic that they wanted to raise that wasn't on my list of 40 things? Council President Goodhouse. The, the big one, and um, I just wanted to re repeat it, reiterate it um, from earlier when we did liaison reports. So I think the uh, most important part of this uh, component of this is really the education portion, social media, um, and putting out there um, either videos or kind of understand what what this is supposed to be doing, what we're going to hope to achieve from this, and why why this is an issue or why this is something we need to address in Tigard. Um, the, the, what so are you suggesting that be added to the proposal somewhere, or what? I, I guess I, I, I want to make sure I know what you're proposing. So we're, uh, during this whole process of when we're creating this, getting this ready, finding a facilitator, and all this, we should be doing an intense um, communication and education series of um, you know what a person of color goes through, what 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 systemic racism is, um, how it's affected, examples in Tigard, and because the biggest thing is I I would hate for all this work to get put together and you still have people saying well why are we doing this why are we wasting money there is no racism in Tigard that was illegal years ago, and I I, I don't think you can as, as you kind of mentioned earlier. It's kind of like a 12 step. You can't really start it until you acknowledge you have a problem. But if we haven't really detailed the problem, then we're, we're, we're half the population is not coming along with this. So I think first okay. part of the process is we need to bring the population along with this, understanding what we're doing, why we're doing it, the, you know, the, the five whys, the what, where, why, all those different things. You want to almost bring everyone along before you start saying, we need to do this, and we just decided, and we're elected officials, and we're saying we're doing this. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that we... It's an acknowledgement and a suggestion very publicly that we have a major public education campaign that we push with stories, vignettes, et cetera, between now and when the commission gets started to educate the public about the reality of um, life in Tigard for um, the BIPOC community. Can I yes. get uh, thumbs ups on that for folks that are supportive of that? Okay. Um, staff, you've got direction there. 
uh, Council President Goodhouse, did you have anything else? Okay, does any any other member wave your hand if you've got a topic? Councilor Lube, what did we miss? Yeah, the only thing um, that I did read uh, that was brought up that I thought was interesting that I, I think maybe we should discuss, and, and one of the things we talked about is um, removing those barriers so people can come to this commission and, and fully participate, which I think is important. Um, but I think we should also, uh, I know it says that the commission will develop the bylaws, but I think also an expectation as far as how many meetings will be attended, you know, um, what sort of the expectation is, um, and maybe what would happen if a committee member needs to be replaced, um, just because I think this is some incredibly important work and we should be as clear as possible about the expectations on participation. Okay, staff, can you take that comment as well? Uh, I assume I assume we're gonna have thumbs for that one, supportive of it. I have a, I hate um, to ask this though, Would, it's similar to the budget committee, do we wanna have, do we wanna look at having an alternate member if in case something happens or somebody gets sick along the way or or anything that someone's up to speed and can fill right in? Actually, I think that suggestion is excellent. I think we, instead of 12, let's ask, uh, let's ask the caucus to come up with, uh, let's say 16, and then we'll select eight with two of them being alternates that would fill in if somebody drops out automatically. What do you think? Okay. Uh, Youth Councilor Calderon, were you also wanting to make a different comment too? Uh, yeah, it's not as big as of an issue, but on the same uh, note as like retraining someone in case something were to happen, I would like to remind Council that my term does end in July. Uh, so um, obviously that seems very far off, but if we start this commission in even like January or February, I would expect that it would go past the end of my term. And same with the BSU designee, they would also have to be retrained in the middle of the year. So um, I, I just- I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's what we're gonna plan. I, I, I think you and whoever's designated from there are probably gonna be on it for the long haul, even through your term, unless you refuse. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's totally okay with me. Um, I'm a junior this year, so that wouldn't be a problem, but I would only worry if the BSU person uh, is a senior this year so just like as a small I'm so sorry as a small note just to be aware of it's not a big yeah, issue well and and maybe that's a point we should emphasize with them that it might be it might be advantageous for them to select somebody that's not a senior okay um, other other comments or things that I missed or uh, or that we didn't discuss Okay. Uh, thank you all for engaging in that very robust conversation. I think we'll have something better. I guess what I was uh, what I was getting to a moment ago before I I process wise for forgot to ask all of you to and check in on what your feedback was. Um, staff, given the quantity of feedback, I think this is probably going to need to come to council again to review and approve the final. Does the council agree with that? Thumbs? Okay, so staff, you've got direction that this, and I think we wanna see it soon so we can be acting on it. I, I would like to be, you know, moving towards caucus stuff in the next couple weeks. So this should be, hopefully revisions happen and the council can approve it in the next I would say no more than two weeks from now. Uh, okay. I'm sure the staff are really happy about that short turnaround. Um, sorry, staff. But that's what our community needs. So, uh, let's see. Assistant City Manager Nyland, is there a uh, administrative report tonight? You guys are going to be thrilled, but yes, there is. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be quick because I know you have um, an executive session following this. 
Um, so as you may have noticed, there's a new feature in your newsletter, an infographic about communications to help with data-informed decisions. We've spent a lot of time working on processes and system improvements, and we are starting to see the results of that. That said, I'm just gonna provide a quick update on some of the projects that we're working on. Total Tyler, which is an enterprise system, we are in the process of finalizing our contract with that vendor, and our steering committee met with the leadership team this morning about next steps and a few decision points. Strategic plan refresh, you have had a couple of briefings about that. Um, we have concluded our outreach efforts and the feedback received so far. Um, we received 175 survey responses, 99 internally from staff and com committee members, and then 76 surveys from community. Um, some of the um, data, 91% of those who responded support our vision, 92% support the strategic priorities, and 90% agree the vision accurately reflects the community values, which is really positive and great feedback. Um, the Fano Creek Trail Crossing, that um, we had a really robust presence on the engaged sites and that survey was online from July 1st through August 3rd. We received 1,800 visitors to that page and 543 people completed the survey. So that feedback is being um, analyzed and the next step is a partnership meeting. Um, I know there's been some chatter about COVID and the signage requests. So wanted to let you know that our design and comms team have created over 500 signs since this pandemic was declared. Between March and April, 173 signs were produced and between May and July, an additional 327 signs were produced. And I'm happy to report that the vast majority of those signs have not been torn down. And we're in the process of creating replacements for um, suggested areas, especially around parks. And then just wanted to give a quick update about library. Um, our library um, is really taking the situation and being really creative and innovative as far as um, providing services. They launched their takeout service on June 17th. And so far over 2,500 patrons have picked up their holds through that curbside service. Um, in July, the library added an outdoor walk-up service desk for um, community members. And so far over 200 people have received assistance through, through that desk. So that is my quick report out. I'm just letting you know some of the work that we are doing and the successes we are experiencing. Thank you, Kathy. That's excellent to hear about how we are working to try to make the library more accessible given, um, given the sort of extended period that COVID is impacting us, so. Yep, and we have all uh, of our departments really thinking creatively about how to open up more services in this unknown time. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, the Tigard City Council at this time will go into executive session to consider the employment of a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent under ORS 192.660 Subsection 2A, all discussions are confidential and those present may discuss nothing from the session. Representatives of the news media are allowed to attend executive session as provided by ORS 192.660, subsection 4, but must not disclose any information discussed. No executive session may be held for the purpose of taking any final action or making any final decision. Executive sessions are closed to the public and we will adjourn uh, directly from the executive session once it's concluded. So good night, everybody, and uh, thank you for all the great work tonight, Council. Bye. Thank you. Bye.